Mr. Wee, you tell me when you're ready to go. Great, thank you. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the City Council meeting of Port Colburn for May the 25th. I'll call this meeting to order. At this time, I'm going to go through roll call. When I call your name, just say here. Uh, Councillor Clayoff. Here. Councillor Bruno. Here. Councillor Baggy. Here. Councillor Wells. Here. Councillor Bodner. Here. Councillor Danch. Here. And Councillors Beauregard and Demaray are not with us this evening. And now we will have our national anthem. to the McKay Choir. We have no proclamations this evening, Council. I'll have Councillors Kalela from Bruno uh, move the adoption of the agenda. Are there any changes to the agenda? Seeing none, all in favor, please raise your hand. Well, that's carried. Any disclosures of interest tonight? Seeing none, we have the minutes of the regular meeting of Council May 10th, 2021. All of Councillors Bagu and Danch move that. Any questions to those minutes? All in favor? That's carried. We have uh, four items pulled this evening, 7-1, 7-2, 7-3, and 7-4. If No, I've got you, Councillor. That's, that's under delegations, so you're all set. Um, as far as staff reports and correspondence go. Okay, I'm going to have Councillor Wells, Councillor Bodner move the remainder of the items, which are 7576, uh, correspondence 8182, 83, and 84, and item 161. All those in favor, please raise a hand. And that's carried. Councillor Bruno from the side. <laughs> Okay. We have one presentation this evening, item 9.1. Uh, Bruce O'Hare, president of Lakeshore Excursions for the cruise ship business case. And uh, staff, Mr. Long, are you? Oh, sorry, I apologize. It's uh, uh, Mr. Higginbottom. You're uh, taking this. Okay, go ahead, Greg. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Council, and uh, through your worship to Council, I have uh, I have the pleasure of introducing uh, Bruce O'Hare as the the lead presenter this evening on uh, Port Coburn's cruise ship business case. Uh, Bruce 
founded uh, Lakeshore Excursions in the year 2000, and he, he currently serves as its uh, president, CEO, and chief technical officer. Uh, Bruce is a, is a sailor and a, a former hotel owner, and, uh, and outside of, of those previous roles and his current role, his, uh, his other diversion in life is being a professional grandfather to four bouncing infants. Bruce worked on the, the cruise ship business case as part of a, a trio of experts and his colleague uh, Grant Eccles joins us tonight and Grant has carved out a notable reputation over 35 years as one of the finest technical practitioners on the operational side of the shore excursion business. He's uh, one of few people uh, who can juggle arrangements for multiple ships in multiple ports simultaneously. Bruce and Grant are also joined by uh, Stephen Burnett, and he is the executive director of the Great Lakes Cruising Association and has spent a lifetime being involved in the cruise industry, chartering ships, designing cruise routes, and at times when he had to scrubbing uh, the hulls. Uh, before I pass it over uh, to Bruce and company as well, we have uh, Ken Lambert uh, joining us, and Ken is, has worked together with, uh, with the other three gentlemen on uh, providing some some consultation and advice with respect to tourism and uh, i wanted to kick things off quickly by recapping why bruce grant stephen and ken are are here this evening and why they've consulted on this this cruise ship business case and it's come as a result of, of port coburn's strategic location on the on lake erie and at the south end of the welland canal which has allowed to uh, has allowed port coburn to flourish as a gateway for commercial shipping but uh, with respect to tourism we know that tourism has been identified by council as as a catalyst for diversifying and growing port coburn's local economy and that led us to to this opportunity to have consultants come in and and uh, do some work for us on engaging cruise ships and uh, developing great lakes cruise tourism in port coburn so with that said, I will pass it over to uh, to Bruce to uh, begin his presentation. Okay, well, thank you very much, Greg. And I'm gonna do a screen share here. And let, if maybe Greg, you can let me know what everybody can see the Port yes, Coburn logo up on screen. You're all good. Is that working okay? Yep. Great. All right, well, thank you very much. And uh, we, Grant and I timed this. Uh, we did a dry run uh, an hour ago and it was 15 minutes. So we're going to go a little bit overboard. We promise we'll, we'll try to wrap this up before the hockey game gets going. I actually contemplated wearing my Leafs jersey today, tonight, but uh, decided at the last minute not to. I'd like to begin these by saying that we're not consultants. We're tour operators and uh, we work in, in about 25 ports in Canada and the U.S. Ken Lambert is a consultant. He's taught us lots about this. And uh, we've uh, leaned on his expertise uh, in, in this partnership. So we joined his team. That said, we have done some consulting work and we actually worked for Viking, Viking uh, Cruise Lines. Uh, they hired us before they announced that they were coming into the Great Lakes. So, so just a little bit of background. We are practical, hands-on business guys. And we like to spend people's money like it's our own. And that's gonna be the premise of this presentation. So uh, let's get at it and uh, see if we can get this done in, in uh, a reasonable amount of time. So this is a cruise destination development plan. Uh, we're gonna use the word multi-purpose a lot. We think if Port Coburn is gonna spend money, it's gotta be multi-purpose. It's gotta impact on the lives of, of the local residents, the taxpayers, the business community and visitors and we don't care how, how that visitor gets there, whether they're coming by car or, or motor coach or getting off a ship, it's gotta make sense, this whole strategy. So that, I wanna say that right up front. Uh, the investment needs to be right size for your community and have a reasonable return on investment for the taxpayer, that's key. Uh, we also believe that waterfronts are inherently public spaces. And we're gonna get to that in a little while. Uh, Port Coburn have great waterfront, being we think underutilized, we're going to find a way to hopefully make some recommendations. We're not going to get deep into recommendations. That's in our report. There's an, ex uh, an executive report uh, summary. It's seven or eight pages long. Uh, we're going to talk about, put some visuals to what we are, what's contained in that report. That's our goal here tonight. Uh, we want to suggest, let's not overspend on this thing. We've seen that in lots of places, and we're going to talk about that. We're careful not to write about it. Uh, we work in some of those ports, but uh, we're going to look at some 
best practices of ways not to spend money on your waterfront. Uh, so we're going to learn from successful ports and we're going to look for a compelling reason why a cruise itinerary planner would plan to spend time in Port Colbert. Uh, so that's, that's our goal. That's what we're hoping to achieve. And uh, here we go. This, now you folks see lots of ships. You see them every day, but you haven't seen this one. There's a couple we're going to show you that you haven't seen. This is the new Viking ship, Octanus, and it's 370 passenger. Viking are a game changer for, for the Great Lakes and everyone included. It's a expedition ship, it's highlighted, and there's a difference between an expedition ship and a classic cruise ship. And these expedition ships, they're building literally 30 plus worldwide. There's a great opportunity for the Great Lakes and Port Colbert. This is a ship that no one has seen and no one even knows about. It's uh, the, I don't think it's been in the trades yet. It's called the Ocean Explorer. It's, it's an expo ship. It splashed last month. They're coming to the Great Lakes next year. It's a 200 passenger, 100 meter ship. And it's one of 10. This is a sister ship. They're built in China. They're finished in Europe. This one's called the Great Mortemeyer. It launched pre-COVID. Got itself in some trouble with COVID as well. Uh, but this is one of 10, three or four or five of those will make their way into the Great Lakes. Ocean Explorer is the first of many. The message here, there's a whole bunch of new ships coming. It's got a kind of a different bow design, as you can see. Uh, it's designed for the Arctic and Antarctic. This slide is a slide of another expedition ship. It's called Le Champlain, but the company is called Le Panant. This is in Perry Sound, Ontario in 2019. And it's a, again, these expedition ships have kayaks, Zodiacs. They're a little bit different. No casinos on these. And they're a little more active consumer. This building here in the background is the Stocky Center. In Perry Sound, they host something called the Festival of the Sound, Canada's largest music, jazz music festival. It's a compelling reason to visit Perry Sound, one of many. And uh, that's a ship that will be in Port Coburn several times next year. In fact, there's, they built five of these ships. That's this specific ship won't be there. Its sister ships will be. This ship is uh, it's, uh, called the Inspiration, Hanseatic Inspiration. It's a German company, Hapak Lloyd. It's a German company. It's actually owned by a company called Tui Marine or Tui Travel, T-U-I, the world's largest travel company. They are a 50-50 partner with Royal Caribbean. They are planning to come to the Great Lakes. COVID canceled their plans. That ship will be in Port Coburn as well. And it's another expedition ship. Here's one you've seen. This Grant took this picture. This is in Port Cobra. And it is the two victory ships built in the US in the 1980s, late 1980s. And uh, Grant was adding them up. I think, Grant, you said there were over 40 visits this year. Is that correct? Approximately, yeah. So those are the, there will be multiple ship days next year when we get back in business. There, there may well be over 60 cruise visits ships tie up on your front parking lot. There's the opportunity. So these are two, each are 200 passengers. They typically sell sold out at around 175 passengers. And uh, the very first ship that started this whole Great Lakes cruise thing off was in 1998. First cruise ship I was ever on in my life. First cruise ship on the Great Lakes in over 50 years. It used to be called the Columbus. It's now called the, uh, the Hamburg, it was purpose built to just squeeze through. This is lock one at Port Weller. The ship is 400 passengers, really got things started. Um, it really was the shape of things to come. Grant, uh, we, we also work in Paris Sounding, and uh, we talked about something that makes a port unique. We're, we talked quite a bit about it in our report. Grant, maybe you want to talk a little bit about who this fellow is and what he's doing and why that ship's in Perry Sound. Absolutely. This uh, fine gentleman is a uh, colleague of ours. That's uh, Paul Connell. He's a retired sergeant in the Ontario Prince of Police. Um, he uh, works with, uh, with us uh, as a representative at the various ports. And when he is at, uh, on the dock, he'll greet people playing the bagpipes, which is a really nice melodic sound. And, and it just seems to set the day off nice for the sightseeing and the and the visits, but it's just a, a nice added feature. Uh, in this case, we look after that, and certain cases, other ports will uh, provide 
some form of entertainment or welcome. Niagara Falls is your competition, folks. Uh, it, you, you in Port Coburn, it's like being 30 miles from the pyramids of the Eiffel Tower. Uh, the competition is formidable. And Niagara Falls, always they do exit surveys, always rates very highly when they ask the passengers, how do you enjoy your cruise? Niagara Falls gets uh, very, very positive responses. So Grant handles our work in Niagara Falls. We each handle different markets. Uh, Stephen handles the East Coast and, and Montreal through to Boston. I look after lots of the uh, northern ports are here on the Great Lakes. But Grant, why don't you talk a little bit about what happens today when yeah. a ship goes into Port Coburn? Yeah, this uh, has one of the uh, the most uh, popular uh, trips is a full day excursion, and that's maybe nine or ten hours. And uh, what we do is we take the people to the Niagara River and uh, drive past the uh, the battlefield at uh, Chippewa. And then the people actually get onto the, uh, the Hornblower cruise boat, uh, have a little bit of free time. We then uh, take them for a delicious lunch, and usually it's at the, uh, the Chateau de Charme, and that's in the little picture in the bottom right. Um, and there they'll have a, uh, a wine tasting, they'll walk through the vineyards, and they'll also enjoy some, uh, some wine with their lunch. And uh, then the tour ends uh, off at uh, Niagara Lake. And uh, there they have maybe an hour and a half, uh, maybe an hour, depending on the, on the timing of the day, uh, to go shopping in some of the, uh, the wonderful little shops there. And then it's approximately a one hour drive back to the ship in Port Colburn. But uh, we're uh, now noticing a bit of a trend is that uh, this tends to be a little bit expensive uh, for the ships to, uh, to offer for their clients. Um, also, a lot of people have already been to Niagara, so maybe they just want to go back and have a quick little visit. And uh, so they're offering half day tours now, which was a new trend. Uh, that means they're back at the cruise ship in Port Colburn at lunchtime and they usually have lunch on the ship. And then they have the uh, afternoon at leisure to, uh, to do whatever they care to do in your uh, part of the uh, Welland in the Niagara area. That's the opportunity, <clears throat> excuse me, that's the opportunity for Port Colburn is either we meant to convince the itinerary planners to make Niagara a half day and leave the other half of the day to visit your community and leave some money behind. This uh, image is, uh, we talked about some ideas of what not to do. And our friends in America have shown us several things that we need to avoid. So if you build a cruise terminal, and I spoke to one of your counselors and, and he said that in, in November, uh, you, you can't build it and hope they'll come. That's exactly what they did in Erie, Pennsylvania around 2010. They spent several million dollars, I think it was nine million, they built a cruise terminal, much uh, big dock, never have had a ship. They never saw it through. They never had product. They'd never figured out the product on shore. They now rent it as office equipment, or office, uh, I'm sorry, an office uh, rental. Uh, they built themselves basically an office building on the water and called it a cruise terminal. So an example of what not to do. Probably the mother of all over buildings on the Great Lakes is in good old Detroit. Uh, there was some stimulus money. They put their hands on it. Uh, they spent $23 million. It sat empty for 10 years. Now, they do get some visits now. Uh, it was complete with holding cells for Homeland Security. The dock's too small. Victory is one of the smaller ships. It, it overhangs their dock. Viking can't go there. It had revenue five years ago of $110,000 on a $23 million investment. So a wonderful example of what not to do. Careful not to overspend. Um, next location, let me go back when I went too far. This is Marquette, Michigan, North Shore of Lake Superior. Okay, actually not North Shore, right more than the South West Shore of Lake Superior. Beautiful community. Uh, this used to be a brownfield. This area here, turn of the century, was a coal dock. Didn't look unlike the Valley brownfield in Port Coburn. 800 foot wall. It's mixed use with parking and marinas and picnic areas and walking trails. It is a wonderful example of how to, to really change a waterfront. We they have been unsuccessful in cruise so far. We think that's going to change as ships move into the, the Northern Great Lakes. Marquette, I'm sorry, Muskegon, Michigan. It's uh, on the uh, eastern shore of Lake Michigan, but 100 miles north northeast of Chicago, and they've been very successful. They had existing infrastructure, they tidied it up, and they really focused on 
product on shore. They had a hop on, hop off, visits to the museums. Uh, they had some interesting things. They had a, a U.S. sub and an LT landing craft. Great me big museum, great art gallery. Uh, but they're very often they have lots of money and they're, they're very aggressive. So a good example of what to do in Muskegon, Michigan. Here's Mackinac Island. That's a hundred year old dock with two ships tied up to it. Mackinac, in some ways, have an unfair advantage. Uh, when you get off the ship, you're already in the excursion. They are the number one port in the Great Lakes in terms of visits, and uh, they'll they'll max out like uh, Bar Harbor in Maine and Key West have maxed out. They just don't quite know it yet, but they will have maybe 60 or 70 visits this year. Uh, multiple ship days. Their infrastructure is only so big. There's 600 horses on Mackinac. We work there a lot, but their infrastructure can't handle the, the growth of the industry. So, uh, but they do it really well. Of all the slides I'm going to show you, I think this is the best one. And it came from Viking. And we asked them, show us an example of what works in Europe. Now, Viking river boats, they have about 80 river boats in Europe. They own 50% of the market. 10 other companies split the other 50%. They responded saying, you know, the best cruise terminal we have in Europe, the second best, I didn't ask them what the best was, is in Stockholm, Sweden, and it's a tent. And they open up the sides on nice days, and they close them on cold days. And you can see this is a turn port, so people get off and new people get on. And it is a successful port. And their point was, you don't have to spend a lot of money on hardware, you have to spend it on software, and that's people. Uh, that, was, that was great to have that. The Carbide Docks, you see Marie, Michigan. It, is, it was condemned five years ago, not unlike some of the piers in Port Coburn. Currently is being part of a $1 billion build to twin the Po Lock. But they hired engineers and they just wanted to make that a more people-friendly place. This is a presentation I sat in on in the fall, and it was exactly the time we were getting to work with, on your project, and we saw what they were doing. These are these are, this is an 800 foot wall, by the way. Your wall is quite a bit bigger than that. But they combined commercial, cargo, aggregate storage, and people friendly space in a way I would not have thought as possible. So behind the berms, this is a landscape berm. That's where they store the aggregate when they're done. They have boardwalks and plazas with festivals and fishing piers, bike trails. It's going to be a beautiful example of how to really change a waterfront. I live in Little Current on Manitoulin, much smaller than Port Coburn. Our waterfront was falling into the North Channel. And 10 years ago, maybe 12 now, uh, our municipality put their hands on $10 million of money from the feds in the province and developed a multi-use, there's that word again, recreational boating is a big deal, a multi-use facility. They tore that thing apart, redid the pilings and seaways, probably gonna do the same thing in Port Coburn. And they did it over the course of the winter. And uh, now this image is 10 years old. This wall is 500 feet long. And these are 35 ton bullets. These are beautiful walkways and stairs and landscaping and lighting. It's an example of multi-use investment. And it's had a great return. That's what it looks like with a ship tied up to it. And on any given day, a couple hundred recreational boats come and go. Many of these boats pass through Port Coburn the recreational boats. Terrace Bay, Ontario, small out of the way little community, but boy, do they know how to develop their waterfront. They got a really sharp EDO. He put his hands on some money. This pavilion will open this spring. I visited it last September, and it is a community space for theaters and festivals. They rented some of this area to Parks Canada. I think they have enough rent income to pay all their, their uh, fixed costs every month, and they've just done a great job. They'll never have ships, they'll never have them to the degree Port Coburn does, but boy, they, it's an impressive example of waterfront redevelopment. We talked about a compelling reason to bring people to Port Coburn, and you compete against Niagara Falls. That's tough. Every port has a niche. Here on Manitoum, where I live, it's First Nations. Sault St. Marie, Michigan, that's where they're doing that carbide dock, they have a viewing station, not unlike Thor, bigger, and they have a Sea Lots Welcome Center. It's run by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and it's impressive. We take thousands of people there. There's no admission. We don't make any money on it. Uh, we make money every time somebody buys something, a motor coach or a guide. 
or an admission to a First Nations. Nothing happens here, but it's a great experience for the passengers. And it's located a couple of minutes from the ship. It's, it's been there for 50, I, well, maybe not 50 years, probably 40 years. Great example of development. Grant, you want to talk about Kingston? Now these guys do something special. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, there's a picture of our good friend, uh, Chris. Uh, Chris works uh, for Kingston Tourism. Uh, he also just happens to be uh, a world famous town crier. So he will uh, go to the main town docks and welcome all the visiting cruise ship passengers um, when they come into the, uh, the city of Kingston. Kingston is a very historical uh, city. It has uh, Fort York, for example, and a now defunct uh, a large penitentiary, which you could actually bring tourists to visit. Um, but uh, Kingston, some of the larger ships, the Kingston will have to tender their passengers in. The town dock is not uh, big enough to uh, have them tie up at. And uh, Kingston is currently in the plans and building a larger dock to accommodate them. Thanks, Grant. And uh, yeah, Kingston, welcome with the town crier. What a great way to set yourself apart. Mackinac Island, it's horses, it's fudge. Uh, they passed a bylaw saying the horses, the cars are scaring the horses in the, around the early 1940s and they banned all cars. They have a lilac festival, busiest weekend of the year, a natural occurring thing that just happens that they've marketed. So again, compelling reasons to visit. They're the most successful port. Little Current's probably number two. And uh, we're fortunate to work there and have done so for a long, long time. So the Port Coburn Advantage, we're back. This is the same slide. It's multi-purpose. It is right-sized investment. It's, it's making that public water, public uh, waterfront accessible to the, the public and green and welcoming and friendly. And that's how we're going to find ways to keep some money and cruise spend in Port Coburn. And so that, uh, that concludes our presentation. But we're wide open for comments or questions. If there's any, fire away. Okay. Can you unshare your screen for us? Great, perfect. Uh, I've got uh, Councillor uh, Bruno and Councillor Danch. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Bruce, for the um, presentation and Grant. Um, I'm just wondering if one of you could tell us, um, at the end of the day, I recall being on um, uh, EDACT and the involvement in hiring, um, uh, well, in one case, a consultant, and in the other case, as you rightly point out, um, you guys as, uh, as tour um, excursion operators. And you referenced in your presentation about, you know, you make money off of those um, when people uh, um, deboard the ship and they go on those tours. So I'm, I'm wondering if you can explain to us where you then after tonight um, and after the report and after working with our tourism people, uh, step out or re-interface. Uh, so if I'm understanding your presentation, um, you get our names and lights with a compelling reason, if I understand this correct, to cruise companies. How do we stay engaged because it's one thing of getting somebody on a tour it's another to 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 stay in their mind and, and stay in their face as a location so I, i'm wondering where we go from here in terms of your role how do you see that or someone like you going forward to keep uh uh to keep us in place so to speak and and maybe greg that's if you if you wanted to answer first, or if you're okay with me, uh, just going to Bruce and Grant. Thank you, gentlemen. Who wants to take that? So I'd, I'd be happy to respond. Uh, where we go from here really is up to Port Coburn. Uh, Greg and Bram extended our contract uh, to do some further work, but uh, there appears to be a will among the, your council to move Port Coburn forward and, and really make that space along your waterfront appealing for tourists generally, and in our case specifically to cruise passengers. So our goal is to work with Port Coburn, with Greg and, and uh, Bram and, and Gary and your staff. We will be available 
as, as long as you need us to assist in helping steer it in the right direction. That I see that as potentially our, our role. And uh, but you know, good question, Gary. That's probably you folks can probably answer that better than us. I think the plan looks looks like there's a commitment there to act on it. Uh, God bless. That's, I think it's the right thing to do. And I, I also feel that, and I've seen that personally return on investment in other port communities. Uh, I don't know if anybody will have as many ships tie up. Everyone needs to tie up in Port Coburg uh, at some point. Not, not everyone needs to go to Mackinac or to Goderich or to Perry Sound or to Sea St. Marie, Michigan or to Thunder Bay. You have an advantage. It's how we exploit that. And uh, we'd be happy to work with you guys on that further. Okay, Stephen. Uh, thank you. Uh, good evening, Council Members. Um, perhaps I can answer Councillor Bruno's uh, very interesting question with a little bit of support here. Um, Greg and his colleagues uh, have taken um, a membership in the Cruise Association. I think that's probably one of the most powerful things they could have done because our role uh, is focused on finding cruise ships. Uh, that is what I do. The role of the coalition is to increase the inventory of cruise ships that we can bring into the Great Lakes. And uh, we've been doing that for many, many years. Um, we work hand in glove with uh, Bruce's organization because once we uh, identify a new cruise ship, um, they need planning services, they need shore excursion services. And so what uh, uh, Bram and Gary and uh, Greg have done is basically join the Cruise Association, which allows them really into the window of where these cruise ships reside. There are about, I would say, 60 of them worldwide, and we're currently hosting nine in the Great Lakes, so our potential is considerable. The potential to increase is considerable. So I think between our organization and what Bruce is doing, um, you're extremely well positioned to grow in a controlled way over the next 10 years. Councilor Bruno? Yeah, I didn't know if Greg or um, Gary wanted to add any more. Stephen, sorry for not recognizing you before. Uh, thank you for that answer. Uh, I guess I'd like a little more meat on the bone if it's available. I mean, you know, there's, there's other folks I then believe like yourself who are vying to package up municipalities and events and locations along the Great Lakes. So I, I'm still not quite clear if, you know, Port Coburn chooses one or many of you guys all trying to um, sell our case as uh, one of the stops. So I, I'm, I'm struggling with where we go from here in uh, it's all fine and dandy that they're part of the cruise uh, association and that they're watching all that. But who's, you know, out there selling? Who's checking that, you know, a ship that comes one year doesn't come the next? The feedback from the passengers, all of that minutia that's hand-holding, that's back of the stage, but really important. Mr. Higginbotham, maybe you want to uh, take a stab at that? Yes, I can. Yes, through through your worship to to Councillor Bruno. Uh, to go back to your original question about about making Port Coburn uh, compelling enough in relation to uh, to Niagara Falls and Niagara on the Lake that get the lion's share of attention right now from these cruise ship companies, that is is something that comes out as a result of this this cruise ship business case, and and I know will be a part of our tourism strategy that is that is being worked on by Mr. Lambert that. There is ongoing product development and experience development that needs to happen in Port Colborne. And I will continue to harp on this word because it's a good word is to make a, to show that the Port Colborne experience is compelling. So we need to work on the compelling elements of Port Colborne's experience in order to, to trap some of that, that tourist activity for, for us in Port Colborne. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay, great. I have uh, Councillor Danch. Thank you. Uh, through you, uh, Mr. Mayor, um, just l listening to everything they said there in that, eh? for the ships and stuff like that, on the wall, of course, we need to tie up a ship. 
Like what? I mean, this victory and whatnot they were talking about would be able to come here. Like what? What length are those ships? And, uh, I'll speak to that. So, the victory ships uh, are just under three hundred feet. The biggest ship, the new one, Viking. That ship is six hundred and seventy-eight feet. So they, that's and that's the variance. Hundred so, meters. Two hundred meters. I'm, I'm sorry. So, like draft-wise, like those are fairly decent vessels. No problem putting them on the wall in Port Coburn. Are we dredging a canal to make this happen, or what? Are we. I'm just looking down the road here. Yeah, no problem putting it on the wall. The uh, it's a responsibility of the seaway to make sure that's a navigable uh, waterway for not just passenger ships that represent 2% of tonnage or less, the, the cargo vessels. So they're all seaway compliant and they're, they are in, inspected and approved by the St. Lawrence Seaway long before they get to Port Coburn, before they're built. Okay. But good question. Yep. Nope. Yeah, you have the, the side of Port Coburn that is where the public works building is, that is one of the very few dock locations on the Great Lakes that will accommodate the larger ships. As a general statement, the ships are getting bigger. The Viking ship is as big as they'll get. Where I live, they can't hold that ship on the wall. Neither can Mackinac. There's the number one and two destinations on the Great Lakes. Uh, Windsor can, Milwaukee can, Detroit cannot, Toronto can, barely. So you, there's another advantage inherent 100 year old infrastructure in your backyard that requires development. The seaway is going to, that's their job to look after that, and they're going to. Uh, I understand they're going to. They're guarded about their timeline. But I, I think, uh, I think you folks probably know more about that than we do. But uh, I think there's a, there, the size of ships in Port Coburn is only an advantage. It is by no means a disadvantage. It's a good thing for you guys. But it's a great question. Thanks for asking. No, no, and th thank you for the answer. So, so just on that, Councillor Danchin, for those watching, the for those that have watched the work that the Seaway has done at the foot of uh, Sugarloaf Street. So, if, if you hear myself and staff talking about it, we refer that to the smaller dock, which is which is the the Victory ships um, and the smaller type uh, vessels. They can they can tie up there. The depth is fine. Uh, we all know that the Limnos and the Griffin, uh, both uh, uh, Coast Guard ships that are that are tying up there. So that's kind of phase one for the St. Lawrence Seaway. Then, as everyone here knows, there's the Knuckle, which is right by our former Public Works building. From there down uh, to uh, the Maple Leaf Mill, or ADM milling now, um, that's a thousand feet. So that's taking on. Um, any cruise ship that comes in, because as we know, I, uh, like the canal itself, uh, I think the, the biggest ships in the canal now are what, around 700 feet or a little bit more. So the ship here coming in at around 680 feet, uh, that uh, that dock will be will be fine. Now that's the dock that they're currently engineering and they'll be working on. The bollard system in behind the wall and the cribbing in behind the wall is 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 original, so that has to be. Uh, repaired. So this, in our discussions with the Seaway, that, that is going to be happening uh, sooner rather than later because the Seaway has to be ready for 2022 for the big ships to come in to be able to dock here in Port Colborne. And as you've heard from our from our consultants, you know, we do have an advantage on the size of dock that we have here that's uh, uh, along uh, King Street. So just for those that weren't sure what that was all about, that's kind of where everything is moving. So the so the first phase is really done from the the seaway. They're they they fenced off the area. It's it's ready to go. So now they're working on the second uh, one. Any further questions, Councillor Danch? Okay, I have Councillor Baggy. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Hi, everybody. A um, couple of questions. You may have answered my first question, Mr. Mayor. What's the total length that the St. Lawrence Seaway can handle the lock? Is it, did you say seven hundred feet or? Uh, yeah, it's, it actually might be 720. I don't know the exact measurement, but 700 feet is kind of the number that's out there. I mean, um, with Viking, they built to almost the full length. They're they're not too far short of a, a laker. So at 680 feet or 678 feet, they're close to the majority of lakers that go through. 
Oh yeah, he mentioned six hundred and seventy eight variable. I don't know what variable means. Is a flag sticking up the back end? I don't know. <laughs> but uh, that's close enough. Uh, my other question is, uh, what, like, for example, for the Viking ships that come in here now, what's their port of call before Park Colburn, and what's their port of call after Park Colburn? Okay, I, I can speak to that if you like. Typically, a ship. Here's how it works: uh, a Toronto and Chicago, or Toronto and Milwaukee, are normally the turn ports. Turn port is where you get on the ship or where you end your vacation, where you end your cruise. So typically you would fly in to Pearson, spend two days in Toronto, check out of the Fairmount uh, after breakfast in the morning, get on a motor coach, one of our motor coaches that we provide with a guide, visit Toronto to, and end up at the ship at three o'clock in the afternoon. The ship uh, has a cocktail party, your luggage is in your room and you get there, and around seven o'clock, eight o'clock at night, the ship unties the lines and very slowly travels across Lake Ontario to Port Weller. Gets to Port Weller, everyone has a cocktail outside and looks at the skyline in Toronto. At night, it's beautiful, and everybody goes to bed. And when they wake up the next morning at seven o'clock, they're in Port Colbert. Kind of how it works. Uh, the passengers typically sleep through the locking up, they get jostled a little bit sometimes safer to have them in bed at night if it rubs up against the wall and not going down the stairs. So that's one of the reasons they do it. And there's a buffer there as well. It takes seven to nine hours to get through the locks. Uh, the next day, the, uh, the Victory ships go to Cleveland and they visit the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. It's a great port. And uh, they, uh, ships will other, sometimes also will go to Detroit. Viking is going to, for the first time, Point Peeling, and they'll drop an anchor and launch their kayaks and Zodiacs and visit the Point Peeling Park. So before Port Coburn, Toronto, after Cleveland, Detroit, and in limited cases, Point Peeling, not Peely Island. And that's, that's a typical a cruise itinerary. Our report contains examples of several itineraries. If, you, if you'd like to get a copy of that, that, that's available to you. And you can see exactly how they do it. Okay, Councillor Baggio. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, my next question, the city of Toronto, from what I'm hearing, their port there is in a heavy industrial, dirty area, I guess you could call it. You didn't have any diagrams of uh, the ports of, uh, or any pictures of Port of Toronto. So what's your opinion on the Port of Toronto? Grant, you want to speak to that? Grant works in Toronto. He manages our work there. We all know it, but Grant, go ahead. Yes, it is uh, it is in a very industrial area. Um, however, there's a lot of uh, room for motor coaches uh, to uh, offload and load passengers. We never recommend to anyone to walk downtown, for example, because there's too many trucks along the way. Um, but the best part is, it has the most incredible view of the city skyline at nighttime. And uh, it's really a convenient location um, for ships to pull in and it's deep enough. Uh, it was initially the Rochester Ferry Terminal was built and it was unfortunately, uh, it was a huge expense on the government part, but they've, able to, uh, they've been able to recoup a lot of the investment and in providing cruise ship, uh, passenger cruise ship uh, terminal space for them. And it just, it, it works well, you can get two, decent sized ships in at one time. And uh, just, again, there's a lot of elbow room to bring coaches in and to get people coming and going. And usually as Bruce mentioned, it's a turnaround port so that uh, people are, um, and baggage and uh, supplies for the ship, et cetera, are happening right at the same time, but there's enough room that people don't uh, step on each other's toes. Great, thank you. Councilor Baggett? Uh, one last question, Mayor, Mr. Mayor, thanks. Uh, financing. Federal government, provincial government, the city of Park Colbert, are there grants available or are there grants supposed to be available through federal or provincial or post COVID grants or what are we actually looking at? Probably in reality. I'm going to go to staff on that one, uh, Mr. Long. Uh, through you, uh, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor uh, Begu. Um, staff are exploring. Um, grant opportunities 
at the federal and provincial levels. Um, I mean, I think it's fair to say that uh, there isn't a, a federal or provincial grant to support cruise, uh, the, the cruise industry, but there are federal provincial grants that may support uh, downtown revitalization. There may be something to support waterfront redevelopment. There are grants to support economic development projects, tourism projects. So the cruise ship project team that has been established uh, are exploring any and all grant opportunities to help us uh, with the redevelopment of that site. Councillor Baggio? Uh, okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor. As everybody knows, we are still waiting for a grant for our downtown infrastructure repairs. So that's also supposed to be coming, but uh, I'll let it go with that, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Great, thank you, Councillor. Councillor Bodner. Thank you, Mayor. Just a, a couple of comments. I'm liking what I hear from the people that were presenting. Uh, cautious approach. Don't, uh, you know, don't spend all the money you could ever get in grants or everything and making some something big and grandiose when, you know, when other areas have succeeded in something much less uh, uh, than the Taj Mahal type thing. Um, and I really think it's up to this council and future councils to to nurture this along. It's early in the early in the in, in our stage of uh, progressing here, and um, I think there's enough expertise out there for us to tap into. You're looking at some some good experts right here on the screen right now, and I'm not talking about council. I'm talking about the presenters. Um, <laughs> And um, I think we've got a great opportunity. We just need to keep it going. And uh, I would hope that uh, future councils uh, see the need to keep this going along. And with the staff we have now and, and the expertise that's available, I think uh, we can really make this work in a cautious way. And, uh, but we need to keep going forward. We can't stall. We can't you know, just put it aside. So that's all I got to say, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Clayla. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to um, Bruce. Great presentation. Thank you very much. I love the cruise line industry. I think it's great. I've cruised for years and I see great potential for Port Colborne. And I, I thank you for bringing this here. I have a question regarding you know, we've, we have great staff working on all this now, and you talk about it being um, a destination, and I look at the theater that we have, the museum that we have, the different associations, BIA, our downtown people. Is this something that you work with them, or is it something that our people pull together? Do you give them ideas as how they can put together destination pieces to work with these groups to develop the kinds of things that you need to have for your um, crews? cruise um, for your cruise clients or is that something that we kind of decide or how does that work? Bruce? So that's, that's a really good question and uh, it, it is very much a collaborative effort. Uh, we have always focused on product development and whether that is a maple syrup tour to St. Rose Island for the French passengers from Europe or completely different from the North American passengers or it is with Viking, their focus is expedition, I, that's kayak and zodiac, and they have two, two, get this, $12 million submarines that they like to use in deep, or Lake Erie's not deep enough for them, they can't use them there. Uh, or it's, we recently brought Viking to Killarney, Ontario, and Killarney hasn't had a ship in 80 years, a passenger ship. It used to be the only way to get there. They've had $45 million injection in private development. And it's a, it's a wonderful, it was, it seemed like a great opportunity for Viking and we brought them there. And now we're working with them developing product. So it's the municipality, it's the cruise line and it's our guys focusing on developing new product. You're only as good as a product you can bring to these people. Viking, when they, we first went to see them and Stephen and I hopped on a plane and flew to Europe and we made 
I think it was eight sales calls in 10 days. And uh, bar we barely slept. We were catching trains at six in the morning to get to the next flight. But we went to Basel, Switzerland. There was the chairman of the company. And at that time, they hadn't told us yet. Our timing was very fortunate. But they were had they've already built the river fleet in Europe and dominated it. They're building every 18 months, launching a new ocean vessel and dominating that space as well. And they were deciding to build an expedition ship. And in came the guys from the Great Lakes. And, but at that, that time they were actively looking at positioning one of their ships in the Norwegian fjords where they've worked for ever. And six months later, they were back looking hard at the Great Lakes. And on January 15th last year in LA, they announced the Great Lakes to the, to the, to the world of travel press. And we were right in the middle of that. So, so it's, it's a, that's a long answer to a short question. It's gotta be the community willing to develop and invest in, in a compelling reason to visit, whatever that is. And our, our staff and our people working with the cruise lines. The competition is Niagara Falls, it's tough. We'll, we'll never get more cruise passengers in Port Coburn than Niagara Falls. If we can get 10 or 15%, we've won. And we've always identified that as our goal. Councillor Clayoff? Thank you. No, good. Great. Thank you, Councillor. Greg, you want to finish off? Yeah, I just want to finish off by saying yes, that uh, as, as Bruce mentioned at the beginning uh, of our present uh, of his presentation is that we do have them uh, doing some some additional consulting work for us. And and to answer Councillor Kalela's question and and earlier an earlier question asked by by Councillor Bruno, there is ongoing product development and experience development happening between in those consultations between municipal staff and uh, and Lakeshore excursions. We, we also have a lot of synergies that have been created as a result of their work and the new tourism strategy that we will be putting forward. So when you talk about Port Coburn carving out an experience of its own that's distinct from what Niagara Falls and Niagara on the Lake is offering, we, we recognize that. We, we see uh, the opportunity in, through Port Coburn's arts and culture assets as well as heritage assets to create experiences that are distinct from, from those that are, are currently dominating the market and those that also serve the uh, the needs and interests of cruise passengers who would be stopping in in Port Colbert. Great. Thank you, Greg. Stephen, Grant, Bruce, and Ken, we really appreciate this, and, and uh, we all look forward to uh, moving this endeavor forward, and as you said, in a cautious manner and putting the right uh, plan together, and I think you, either got, you are the guys that can help us do that, and I did enjoy my time at the uh, conference where you allowed me to speak and uh, that went very well and it was good to, uh, to meet uh, most of you gentlemen there and also some other uh, speakers that uh, presented that day so that was fantastic and uh, and our, our staff here uh, Greg uh, Bram and Gary are, are working diligently on this and I know council's given them uh, many ideas which uh, we're going to be moving forward with so you know this is exciting it is exciting for the community it's questions I'm answering all the time out in public so whether it's at the uh, Food Basics, the Sobeys, or, or Frank's store when it's open and you can actually go in. But uh, uh, those are things that we hear as councillors and, and, and the mayor's office. So we, we are looking forward to 2022 when these ships uh, start coming here. So again, uh, again, thank you, and, and we look forward to seeing you again. Appreciate it. Thank you. It was our pleasure. Take good care. Okay, we're on to item 10 under delegations. We have item 10.1. It's a letter from Dave Bodner, a request to receive exemption to attend Centennial Park, Cedar Bay Beach. Uh, I need to get this on the table. I'll have uh, Councillor Bodner and Councillor Wells put that on the table, and I know Councillor Bodner wanted to speak to this. Councillor Bodner. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Full disclosure, Dave is my cousin. Um, we grew up side by side in Gasline. And um, and I think, um, and while I'll speak to Dave's request, I think this goes a little further than just his request. A lot of times um, we set policy and um, 
and with good intentions. And then as we go along, we discover that maybe we hadn't thought of something. Um, and I think this is kind of the case, uh, certainly is for Dave. And I think it might be for other people that, uh, that grew up in the area, then Homerson Township uh, in the gas line area and had uh, many great experiences um, at Centennial Beach, uh, Cedar Bay. And um, they'd like to go back uh, when they visit and uh, kind of uh, remember what went on there. Um, and I think in Dave's case, um, if you've read the, uh, his request, um, something he doesn't mention is that certainly um, uh, his dad's name is on the cenotaph there, along with my dad's, and a lot of uh, people from Hummerson that uh, that served in the war, and that's a reason for people to go back and visit and kind of uh, think about their parents at that time. Uh, and it's not like um, I believe the people coming there are going to camp for the day on the beach. They just want to walk up there and have, you know, have their memories of what uh, went on there before. And I wonder if we might, the easy way to, would be to say, well, you're not from Port Coburn now, and um, let's just stick to our guns, and, and that's the way it is. Um, I wonder if council would entertain, and certainly council's decision, that. Um, we send this request back to staff to kind of think about and um, mull over because I I don't have a good feeling on how to how to make this right um, if that's the in council's intent uh, tonight. Um, I mean, I don't know. There could be um, requests like this entertained by either staff or a small committee or something uh, that, that we haven't even thought of. But uh, I'd just like to have staff think about this. Um, council certainly could put in their um, thoughts on it to uh, whatever staff member is gonna, gonna do this and maybe come back with, with a way this could work or not. Uh, but obviously, you know, have have just a, a better thought than just coming here this evening. And I, I'll I'll leave it like that for now. And uh, and I'd be interested to hear other councilors' point of view on this. Thank you, Thanks. Councilor. I'm going to go to staff. Mr. Bowles, is there a, uh, because it sounds like we may want to bring the R word in, which is a referral. Uh, which I can't take from Councillor Bodner at this time, but we can uh, move this along through other councillors. But uh, Mr. Bull, is there anything to add before, if uh, Council does want to refer this, uh, maybe you can answer some of the questions now, or is it something better to be sent to your department and you come back to us? Yeah, through the Mayor to Council and Councillor uh, Bodner, it, it, this was a very unique request and it was, it was interesting because we, we heard about it as staff as well. Well, with council's direction that uh, we'd limit the beach to current residents of the Niagara region. Um, and just for clarity, right now, it's only open to the citizens of Port Colborne with the stay at home order. Um, we kind of found ourselves tied on, on this one because of that direction. So we appreciate Councillor Bodner's, I think, comments and alluding to that, to that fact. Um, as staff, we're, we're happy to put some thought into it. Um, it probably would lead to some mechanism where we provide staff with some discretion for the stories that may be told. Um, but then that will have to be balanced with the fact that um, we may have verification on this story, but there could be other stories which may be harder to adjudicate down the road. But staff is happy to put some more thought into it if council wants to um, send it to staff. We don't have a direct answer at the present time other than, I guess, that um, discretion provided by council 
for when somebody does pull up and have um, a story or, or something along those lines. Thank you, Mr. Bowles. I'm going to go to Councillor Bruno and Councillor Danch. Sorry, Mr. Mayor, I think you recognize me, but you faded out there. Is that right? Yep. No, I, sure. you're up. Um, yeah, I like Councillor Butter's idea. I think there's probably someone else who's faced this issue, and maybe the starting point is um, there's a plethora of um, communities and beaches now that have, uh, uh, have restrictions on who can enter uh, their property, whether it's by municipal boundaries or, or the region. So I think the first place to start would be seeing what others have done. You know, I, I think about Fort Erie and other places that have done this now for more than a year. And so they may have crossed that bridge. Um, but I, I'm happy to to look at ways to make that happen, whether it's, uh, you know, um, designating CSR right to hear the story, whether it's getting the, somehow the word out, whether it's, you know, um, vouching for by a citizen, right? And uh, some some day passes if they're here for a couple of days. But I think I think that Councilor Bonner has got the right idea of, uh, of, of passing it on to staff. And I, I certainly think where we'd want to give the benefit doubt to those kind of situations. But uh, I'd be surprised if somebody uh, um, hasn't crossed this path before. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Dash. Thank you uh, through you to uh, Ron. I'm sorry, I couldn't get his letter to open on my iPad. I'm sure it's a illiterate thing on my part. Like, how often would your brother come to town? Cousin. Councillor Bodner. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, yeah, Dave comes, tries to come once a year. Um, and it's for a short period. Uh, actually, uh, during Canal Day is the odd time it it would happen. Um, this year, I think it's maybe going to be September. Uh, of course, COVID changes things. Um, so, you know, it could, once a year. So, so, so not too often. So I think it's maybe if uh, Brian's looking at that, maybe just like a, a visitor's day pass type of thing, you know, for that once a year guy so that you know he could at least go down to the beach that he played on as a kid you know uh i just think that'd be a simple way to just you know give him that visitor pass but uh, just a two cents from me thank you thank you councillor yeah. councillor wells thank you George. um just to comment on this one here we can't forget that a lot of the decisions we made in regards to restrictions are all based upon the COVID issues uh, the experiences that we had last year, um, we're starting to see some of those experiences again, starting to creep in now, uh, again this year. So uh, again, these uh, decisions that we made, the restrictions that we put in place are not carved in stone. We can, we can change them, um, but I think being in the uh, hard times we are with COVID, um, we made those tough decisions and I think we have to bear those in mind and continue on with those. Um, if we let one exception go, then we continue to, we'll have to let more go. And um, I would sooner be uh, doing that after COVID rather than during COVID. Thank you, Councillor. Um, so seeing no questions, and I know what Councillor Bodner has asked for, the only two councillors that haven't spoken are Councillor Clayleff and Bagu, which is good. So if I could have Councillors Clayleff and Bagu move that we refer the letter to staff to report back to council. Uh, and in the meantime, council can talk to Mr. Bowles and put their thoughts in also uh, a little further than what they've given tonight, if that's okay. Is that all right, uh, Councillor Baggy and Councillor Clayoff? Okay, so we'll do that with Clayoff and Baggy moving that. There is no debate on uh, referrals. So I'm gonna call the question. All those in favor of referring it back to staff, please raise your hand. That's carried. Thank you, council. Thank you, Mr. Bowles. Item 11 is the mayor's report. I have a very short report uh, this evening. Um, the province of Ontario continues the under, under a stay at home order, which we hope will be lifted earlier than uh, anticipated, which is next week, as our COVID case numbers continue to drop and our vaccination rates continue to rise. If you have not received your vaccine, go to the Ontario.ca website to book an appointment or call 1 888 999. 6488. 
as part of our safe and gradual reopening. Last Friday, we opened our beaches, marina, and boat ramp. Playgrounds, the Discovery Spray Pad, Trails and Parks are also open for outdoor exercise. Our beaches will be for Port Coburn residents only until the stay-at-home order is lifted. If you have questions in regards to City Hall services or would like to report a concern, you can contact a customer service representative Monday to Friday from 8.30 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. by calling 905-835-2900 or by emailing service at portcoburn.ca. Alternatively, you can visit our website, www.portcoburn.ca, and submit a request for service or inquiry by clicking on the Request a Service tab located on the top right corner of your website page. Whether you're a citizen, business owner, or city councillor, we are here to assist you and provide customer service excellence through all service channels, internally and externally. In-person appointments will be scheduled for essential and time-sensitive services, where possible services will be provided through remote means. We continue to provide Port Coburn residents with the Participate Pass, so everybody get theirs. I think we're well over 2,000 that uh, have uh, logged in for, uh, which will give you free access to Nickel Beach and Centennial Bay Beach, uh, or sorry, Centennial Cedar Bay Beach uh, this season, just by showing your pass. You can apply online at www.portcoburn.ca or give our CSRs a call at 905-835-2900. The City of Port Coburn welcomes not-for-profit organizations and service clubs serving the needs of the residents of Port Coburn to apply for a discretionary grant based on the provisions included in our grant policy. Visit our website to review the eligibility requirements and download the application form. The application deadline is June 30th, 2021. And any questions you may have, you can direct them to uh, Mrs. Nancy Giles, uh, the Executive Assistant to the CAO and the Mayor's Office, and her extension is 301, and that's 905-835-2900. You can either ask for Mrs. Giles or you can press 301, and Nancy will be happy to answer any questions from our service groups uh, within the City of Port Coburn, and some of those that are beyond that actually service uh, citizens right here in Port Coburn. That's it for my message. Other than, please, get your vaccine. I think the, the ages now are down to 18, and uh, they look like they may be going down to 12 shortly from the province. Uh, our valet center continues to be our vaccination center here locally. We also have some of our doctors that are giving it, uh, Bogio Pharmacy, as well as the NHS as their Seymour Hanna and the other uh, uh, municipal uh, uh, sites uh, across Niagara. So please get that needle as soon as possible. Any questions, Council? Seeing none, uh, this evening uh, the Regional Councillor is not with us, uh, Barb Butters, so we'll welcome her back uh, next uh, meeting. On to item uh, 13. Staff remarks. Staff. Who wants to start? Uh, Mr. Cartwright. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I just wanted to give Council a bit of an update over the weekend's activities on the beach ends and uh, the main beaches with regards to parking enforcement. <clears throat> over the course of the weekend, we issued a total of 26 tickets, uh, 19 of them at Pleasant Beach, a majority of which were $160 tickets, and in some cases, there was a number of vehicles towed. Uh, Lorraine Road, uh, there was two. Weaver Road, there was one. Cedar Bay, there was one. Wildwood, there was two. And Lake Road, there was one. A brief update with regards to our, our parking situation. Um, the control of the beaches, both of Centennial and Nickel, was well done. Staff were on point, uh, directing people who were out of town not to be not to attend, to leave and go elsewhere. The, uh, the issue around uh, Pleasant Beach, I think, is ongoing and will continue to be ongoing because of the tollway. There was a lot of conflict that took place in particular on Saturday with staff. They handled it reasonably well. Uh, I just wanted to give council a bit of a uh, heads up just in case you do get some complaints because of the numbers of tickets that were issued. So that's all I have for now. If there's any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer. Great, thank you, Mr. Cartwright. Any questions with regards to Mr. Cartwright's report? Uh, Councillor Wells. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, through you to, to Tom, 
Uh, Tom, I heard uh, some issues in regards to people staying past and um, the nine o'clock time. I know we were supposed to have signs up uh, uh, prohibiting parking from nine to six a.m. Um, can you give me a status on when some of those signs might be available and uh, when they might be put up? Mr. Cartwright? Through your worship, uh, Chris might be better suited to answer that question. I know in speaking to Steve last week, there were still some signs on back order. They'd yet to arrive. I'm, I'm not really familiar with when they anticipate getting them. Mr. Calabuda? Uh Through you, Mr. Mayor, we are currently uh, just awaiting some signs, so they should be in within the next uh, week or two. Um, and we're also looking for some uh, temporary uh, sign posts. They should seem to be in uh, short supply. So we're also waiting on those and there's no word of when they are going to be arriving yet, as of yet. Okay, thank you. Councillor Walls? Uh, one further thing, um, and uh, this may be able to be answered by Tom again. Um, it's in regards to some of the fire lanes that we do not own. Uh, I know that some of them have been experiencing some overflow from the no parking areas that we have. Um, is there, um, uh, I know we have signs coming for some of the, the roadway entrances. Are there any uh, opportunities for us to um, enforce the parking on there through the fire um, situations or the access situations? Mr. Cartwright. Uh, Your Worship, unfortunately, uh, I, I did speak to you earlier today concerning this very issue. The fire routes are being enforced, the private roads or fire routes as we know them, fire lanes, but they are known as fire routes within the bylaw that's uh, used to uh, enforce it. Uh, we're able to post those uh, at the beginning and ends of the roads as uh, fire tollway zones. Unfortunately, the city streets or the fire lanes that the city owns have not been addressed only in the sense that it would take a, a motion of council to revise the current city uh, no parking on streets by law to accommodate the uh, signage on those particular streets that's not to say that we couldn't put up uh, uh, fire route signs no parking but it would not be enforceable councillor walls thank you um, um that's it for my questions great thank you councillor dash uh, thank you once again uh, if you were lucky enough to get your car towed away how would you know where to call? That would be my question. Mr. Cartwright? Uh, Your Worship, the signage in the particular area is being updated to include uh, where it is, the phone numbers of contact, both by law enforcement and or the tollway company. Uh, those signs should be installed, we're hoping by the end of the week. Uh, uh, they are in the process of being produced. Uh, any of the people that had their cars towed away this past weekend, our by law enforcement people met them at the site and, and directed them as to where to get them. And that's where some of the confrontation got involved. Councillor Danch. Good, thank you. Councillor Bodner. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, through you to Tom. Tom, please thank your staff. Uh, I, I visited Centennial on Sunday. Yeah, Sunday and Monday. Uh, coming home from work. Um, I didn't tell them who I was when I pulled in on Sunday and they grilled me pretty good. Um, and um, so we had a conversation and I think they said they turned away 20 cars on Sunday, they, they reckon. Um, and then uh, when I stopped by Monday, uh, it appears that the sign that is there was working quite well informing people that it was for Port Coburn residents only. Uh, many people stopped, read it, and left. Others tried to get in and were unsuccessful, were turned away. But um, the staff certainly seemed to be doing a great job. And um, kudos to them because I'm sure they had a, a couple of incidents that weren't... Uh, as nice as most people were. So pass that on, please. Thank you. Uh, Your Worship, if I could, uh, just in uh, answering Councillor Bodner's comment, we appreciate that. It wasn't really the bylaw staff, that would have been the uh, parks and I think Brian staff that would have been uh, at those entry points over the course of the weekend. Uh, we did the enforcement elsewhere. Because of their efforts, we didn't have to do any enforcement in those particular areas. Thank you. Great. 
Thank you, Mr. Cartwright. Thank you, Councillor Bodner. Uh, any other staff members with anything for Council? Mr. Bowles. Thank you. Uh, through the Mayor to Council, I have a couple staff updates. Um, after the conversation we just had on Centennial Cedar Bay, just to share with Council uh, some of the statistics. Uh, we had increasing usage throughout the week. Uh, Saturday, we had 16 resident carloads. Sunday, 22, and on Monday, 36. Um, I think in the conversation that had just happened, uh, or the commentary had just happened, on Sunday, we turned away actually 30 non-residents, uh, about half of them from Niagara, half of them from outside of Niagara. On Monday, uh, that number was down to 11, uh, three from Niagara and eight from the GTA. On Nickel Beach, on Saturday, we had 15 residential carloads on Sunday, 20, and on Monday, 25. Uh, people are really interested to come to Nickel Beach because on Saturday, we turned away 30 non-resident carloads. By Monday, we turned away 80 non-resident carloads. We will be um, preparing, and our goal is by the end of the week to have the uh, communication open so that way those individuals that are from outside of the city of Port Colburn that would like to visit Nickel Beach could book a time uh, for when the uh, stay at home order is complete. So there will be messaging going out towards the end of the week, early next week on that, as well as uh, information on how they can register. And again, everybody has to pre-register before they come. Uh, there won't be this showing up and then and getting um, in kind of model. We're really trying to control the uh, the lineups and the number of people that are coming into the beach. Uh, I guess the other commentary just on the beaches is, and council might be interested to know about this, uh, the participate pass is being uh, well sought after. We are now at 3000 uh, residents that have signed up for the participate pass. Uh, for those residents or anybody that may be listening, we did have a late shipment of the passes come in. Uh, staff have now received them and are working. They were working additional hours today to get the, uh, the mailings put together and send them out. And we'd encourage any residents that want to go to the beach to continue to show their um, Port Colburn identification and we'll let them on the beach like we did on the last, uh, on the last weekend. Uh, that's, a, that's an update on the beach pass and the, and the beaches. Uh, maybe before I continue with my other couple updates, any any additional, if there's any council questions on that. Questions, council? No, go ahead, uh, Brian. Uh, another comment, and, and we did receive some feedback on this one, and just to bring forward to council, and we're happy to take future direction on this. We did put up barricades uh, in HH Mill Park going towards the boat ramp. We did that going into the weekend. We, we recognize that not a lot of um, opportunities have been open. And when we opened up the boat ramp in accordance with guidelines, uh, there was anticipation that uh, the number of uh, vehicles and boats uh, could over, could certainly need some extra direction. Um, and that's where the barricades were put up. We did have staff moving back and forth between the location uh, over the weekend. The barricades have been removed, and I guess at my commentary to, to council, we do think that they were they were supportive and they did help in the situation. We did have staff out there, so we were obviously having people walk around and, and looking for safety of the residents and the staff. Uh, it is something that we're going to have a conversation internally about moving forward. We're happy to take in the coming weeks uh, commentary from council and their thoughts. Um, staff right now would be considering the potential to pull out uh, the barricades again um, on days or weekends such as the Canada Day weekend where the potential activity could be quite significant and reducing traffic flow where the boats and the uh, cars coming through may uh, intersect and we may have staff out there to reduce uh, that for safety reasons we think may still be something that we may bring forward but we'd certainly um, give council the heads up as we move forward so we appreciate I think the support with that but if there's any commentary of council on it, we're happy to take that either now or um, in the coming weeks. Great, thank you, Mr. Bowles. Sorry, if yep. council, 
through the mayor, if I can give two more updates. Uh, yep, go ahead. Please, the council. Uh, just a quick update off also on the Sugarloaf Marina. We put in almost 100 boats on the weekend. They were very busy putting in uh, putting in boats, and uh, people are are really interested to get back on the water, which was uh, fantastic uh, to see. A number of boats are planned to come in over the coming weeks, and our boat ramp um, honk mobile and our pay and display machine were both working the whole time at the uh, boat ramp. Um, we, we sold 136 seasonal boat ramp passes so far, which we were really impressed with, with how quick that went. Uh, and we'll continue to monitor that. Unfortunately, the, the PD, the, the pay and display machine doesn't give us an update until the end of the month and it gives you a reading by day. So we'll get you that once that comes out. And then the last one, which actually isn't to maybe a rec location, You muted yourself. In a key computer, apologize to council. Uh, an update on our uh, progress with our monthly water billing project. Um, we hope to be ready by October and it's May 25th and we're ready to go. If council is okay with us to move forward, we could move to monthly water billing starting in uh, the June, the June billing would be the beginning or the last bill under current cycles. And then by July, everybody would be on a monthly uh, water bill. Our, our plan, if council was okay with that, is we'd write a separate letter that would go with everybody's bill that would explain, depending on what cycle you're at, how this affects you and how it rotates into the monthly billing. And you would get uh, additional information on how to sign up for the $25 credit that we approved in the budget if people go on the monthly payment system. So I, I just bring this forward to council that we are ready to go and we don't necessarily need a decision from council today, but I thought it was a good news story. And as well as all the great work that staff did, I think over the weekend at our locations, just the internal finance staff, kudos to them to be having us ready at this point in time to move forward with monthly water bills. Great. Thank you, Brian. Councilor Bruno. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, that's good news, um, Brian, on the monthly billing. I, I would certainly support bringing it forward with the proper um, pre-letter going up because people, I think, will be um, at different stages of the billing cycle. And as long as it talks about when for them, um, uh, they start on monthly. I, I also think the um, the idea of of doing it monthly sooner rather than later is for many people, the monthly bill on water ends up being their highest, whether it's being the pool, um, the garden, the lawn, the car, um, those power wash, the house, all that kind of stuff. And I think there's no better time to see um, a benefit of rolling that out. And particularly you know, that monthly bill I see is the potential to also head off. I mean, imagine if you're using a lot of water and there's a leak or a toilet hung up and now the months you're using a lot of water also ends up being the month that your toilet's been leaking for two or three months as well. But time you get the bill and I know as counselors, we've all had those cases when you hear from somebody who's got this, you know, warpedly high um, bill and um, you know, if the uh, if the leak started, uh, if the toilet hung up was the day after the last billing, that's a long time uh, to be running water. So I think that's the other good thing about monthly. And provided there's the proper rollout letter, and and staff can accomplish that, I'd I'd, I'd love to see it as early as you can. That's just my opinion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Councillor Clayle. Through you, Mr. Mayor, do, do we need to make a motion for that? Because I'd be willing to make a motion that we go ahead and have Mr. Bowles send out, start the process as quickly as possible. Mr. Bowles? Uh, through the mayor to council, I believe we have the authority or, or at least the approval to move forward with it. Um, we propose the October timeframe. If council wants to give me additional support that way we're as staff happy to happy to take it um 
otherwise, if there, I mean, if there is no objection, we're also happy to move forward that way as well um, and get this underway. So, uh, if it's consensus of council, uh, give your thumbs up and we'll move forward. We've asked staff to move forward with this. He's come uh, with it earlier than than uh, expected. So, give me the thumbs up, council, and we can move forward with this. Frank, no? Oh, okay. All right, there you go, Mr. Bowles. Consensus on council is is move forward. I think it's great to hear this. And, and kudos you. to your staff, believe me. Thank you, Council, for uh, the extra time for those number of updates. Okay, any further staff updates? Okay, seeing none. Councilor remarks, I'm going to start with... Uh, I'm going to start across my top of my screen. So, Councillor Kalev. I have nothing tonight, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Baggy. Left a message. I told him he could pick it up. I, I'm sorry. Councillor Baggy. Oh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just a couple items. Uh, it might be in the later on customer service report, but. I had a couple of phone calls from people telling me that they called somebody at City Hall and they haven't got a call back yet and they're waiting for a phone call and they don't know how long they should wait before they call their city councilor. One was five hours after they called, they called the city councilor and uh, want to know why they didn't get a call back yet. Uh, so basically, I don't know, maybe through the CAO, is there some sort of guideline, timeline for residents that call? Not just customer service, but say uh, Mr. Kalamutu, they call him personally on on the city phone, or Mr. Cartwright, or Mr. Bowles. And uh, is there a turnaround time that is sort of expected, Mr. Cao? Sure, through your worship to Councillor Bagu, that's a great question, and I appreciate you bringing it up here to give me a chance to answer. the um, The city actually has an existing policy that every phone message. So that's a voicemail message should be returned within 24 hours. I can say we're not perfect. Even I myself sometimes, as the person who's enforcing the rules, am the one who breaks the rules. It A lot depends on vacations and meetings and so on. We are developing a service standard right now. The HR department is working on a standard that will tell us when, sorry, how much time is permitted. Uh, five hours I think is okay. A couple of days I don't think is okay. Um, what I would like to, I can follow them up if they're through the customer service. So I guess there's sort of two things here. One is a voicemail that's deposited in an inbox, in someone's inbox. And if it's, you know, I left a message for the economic development officer because I want to open a business and it's been a week and he hasn't called me, that's uh, absolutely a problem and that exceeds the 24 hours. The other one is a call to customer service because I do hear from time to time and I'm not sure that's what you're describing but I do hear from time to time, I have reported an incident through the customer service uh, phone line and I haven't heard back about the repair being completed or so on. And those ones are a little bit more disconcerting because we do log all of those calls and sometimes we start to track them down and we find out that the person hasn't called City Hall. So there's this, this disconnect between what they're telling the council member and what's actually taken place. So absolutely bring those ones to uh, to me and I'll run them down and make sure that the service is being completed and the resident is being filled in or um, you know responded to. And when those customer service standards are ready on response times, I will have, um, I will take steps to make sure that everyone on council sees them. Councilor Bagu. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. CEO. And it's good to see you're applying for your resident uh, beach pass. It's, uh, I guess the only reason why you're moving to Park Holman is for your beach pass. Uh, my next, uh, just a, a comment, uh, took a drive down to Nickel Beach. Somebody in the city did a tremendous job pitting the lifeboat, the welcome lifeboat going to Nickel Beach. And uh, please uh, thank whoever did that. It looks tremendous and uh, way better than it did last year. And uh, it's a very welcome sight. 
And my uh, last comment is, it was so great to see the market open last Friday. Uh, there was tons of people online. Everybody was social distancing. The people that are running it did a great job. And uh, like, welcome back to our Friday morning market. That's all, Mr. Mayor. Thank great. you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Wells. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, just a, a point of clarification um, with Tom in regards to the fire lanes. We are still um, planning to uh, post signs on our own fire lanes. Is that not correct, Tom? Mr. Cartwright? Your, uh, your Worship, to yourself and to Council and Councillor Wells in particular, my understanding is, and I stand to be correct on this, I'll verify it tomorrow morning, but my understanding is that we cannot post the city-owned roads or fire lanes because that was not part of what council had originally passed. We, we dealt, we are in the process of dealing with the private fire routes or fire lanes, the private ones, and we are going to be posting at both ends of those roads. Um, by all means, if council wants us to put signs at the ends of the city owned streets we can do so but remember they're not enforceable as far as towing and or ticketing because they're they're identified differently within a city bylaw councillor walls thank you um i have no other further remarks or comments at this point in time thank Great. you thank you mr carter can you make sure that with uh with your staff you can come back to Councillor Wells and uh, include all the other councillors um, with regards to Councillor Wells' question so that uh, uh, whatever needs to be done uh, for the two Ward 4 councillors, we can bring that back to the next meeting. Is that all right? Yes, Your Worship. I'll have that answer out to everybody tomorrow. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wells. Councillor Bodner. I think I'm good, Mr. Mayor. Staff took care of stuff. I don't need to say anything tonight. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Danch. Thank you uh, for that, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, pretty sure you guys all know my question, and uh, so we're going to ask it here publicly. And we know we've got our uh, seasonal gas moving into the community and uh, living in uh, our parks and. Uh, vacant properties and trailers and stuff like that and uh, the b and e's in the backyards and the sheds and the garages and stuff like that have just been overwhelming lately um i'm not a facebook guy i, I don't do all that stuff my wife shows it to me because personally I, I i just not into that but anyways we know what's going on and i i really think we need to get the hammer down um one thing that was said to me that the bus comes to Port Colburn, the people get off the bus and they stay here. And I'd like to know what we can do to deter that. And I'd like to know what the police bylaw are going to do to stop some of this stuff because it's just getting way out of hand. I'm going to start with the CAO. Sure, through your worship to Councillor Danch. I appreciate the heads up on this earlier uh, in the weekend. Um, I was, because you asked me to look into this, able to speak to Port Cares and two different NRP staffers from the Port Colburn detachment. Um, I know that there is a perception that there's increased criminal activity, break and enter, stolen goods from yards and so on. Uh, they don't think that it's people who aren't already in town. I don't know about the bus you know, I've heard that bus story before. Um, the one in uh, Port Cares thinks that their numbers are about the same. They're not seeing more homelessness or more use of the reach out center. Um, the folks on the NRP are saying that crime statistics are about the same, but they did have some insight. They said they are laying charges. Most times they know who the offender is and they're able to follow up on reported crimes. They told me one of the worst things that can happen is the folks who are the victims of these crimes, something's missing from their yard or missing from their garage. The worst thing you can do is go on Facebook and tell your friends, although that's a start because now your friends can lock their cars and lock their doors, but they have to follow through by reporting it to the police. The police will follow up on everything that's reported and those statistics actually help to get the budget for the police dollars in Port Colburn. 
And a couple of examples where that helped out. Uh, something was reported on Facebook, on one of the Facebook groups in the community, but it was also reported to the police, and the police officers who were on a different call were able to see the stolen materials in a yard and were able to recover them because they were aware of it being called in. Um, it's not a good idea to say on Facebook who we think it is because when we get into court with the right guy, if somebody said on Facebook that a different name, that can be used in the defense of the right guy. So we want to make sure they're reported to the police. It's very, very easy to do. So homelessness in and of itself is not a crime, but when there's a criminal element like stealing or breaking and entering, if it's an emergency, call 911. If it's after the fact or if it's a non-emergency non situation, 905-688-4111 or right on the police's website, which is N sorry niagarapolice.ca, Top right hand corner, I'd like to, and there's only two choices, one of which is report a crime. I know Councillor Kalalif is very passionate about this. When we make that report, and if you click all the way through to getting a report number on your screen, that is in the police's database. database. And number one, it helps report Port Colburn statistics. Make sure we get the budget that we need for Port Colburn, but it also has, it starts the wheels turning on an investigation and we can find sometimes, many times, recover the stolen objects. Um, the last thing, as I've said, and I'll pass it on, I think the mayor has some comments too. Homelessness in and of itself is not a crime. A lot of times we think there's lots of homeless people. Uh, the one officer who works closely with them um, is aware of many homeless individuals in the municipality, but sometimes it's the same ones moving from place to place moving from private property to the seaway or from the seaway to the land behind a department store. And uh, it looks like there's three different places, but three different groups, but it's only one group in three places or one individual in three places. If a resident or a council member or a staff member knows of an individual who needs some intervention in the form of a homelessness outreach worker, we're to use the number 211 a three-digit phone call from your phone, 211, to get an outreach worker assigned to that individual. So that's the information that I gathered, and I think the mayor spoke to some of his contacts too. Yeah, great. Thank you, Mr. Seo. Thank you, Councillor, for the question. And, and as, as uh, Mr. Louis stated, it's imperative, imperative that you report it. If it's not a 911 call, there's the phone number uh, on the NRP website and then the also the uh, reporting via the website. Um, I had a phone call last week from a, a, a gentleman who was helping a, a neighbor that had something stolen. And I, I asked him, I said, did you guys report it to the police? He goes, oh, not yet. And I said, please report it. If the police get the reports, they can keep an eye on areas that are having uh, issues. So if, if you're in a neighborhood that's not having an issue, you may not see the officer that often. But if you're in a neighborhood that's having several issues, uh, maybe in, in the, this case what the counselor talked about was break and enters, then they'll patrol that area more and also there may be more undercover people that are sent down to Port Coburn. We don't know who they are. You don't know who they are when they're driving by, but they do keep an eye on, on certain areas. Um, so those people did put it in uh, and the items were found and, um, and, and they were returned to, to that uh, senior. So it is imperative, and as, as Scott said, like it's, it's, it's easy to put things on Facebook to state that the police aren't doing their job. Quite frankly, they can't do their job unless somebody reports a crime. Putting it on Facebook is not reporting it to the police. Um, so we, we want you to get out there. We, we need you to make those uh, reports, whether via, via telephone or online. And as uh, Councillor Claylof has said many times, make sure you take it to the end and get that uh, incident number uh, to help carry it through and, and give the police as much information as you have. We all know today there's lots of doorbell cameras and people are putting cameras on their properties. If you see something suspicious, you know, you can call that in and, and give the information to the police because it may trigger something that happened in a nearby area. It may be a vehicle that goes by or a person walks by and they can tie that in. I know with um, some of our other cameras around town, they've been able to track back uh, a, a criminal and are able to actually read license plates uh, with the quality of cameras and they've been able to catch some people uh, in Port Coburn. This isn't a Port Coburn issue, this is a, a, an issue across Canada 
about burglaries, but based on statistics uh, and, and speaking to our staff sergeant, we're not being overwhelmed with uh, break and enters any more than any other municipality around. And uh, I did report in the paper, based on what's happened in downtown in past years, uh, we've had a few incidents lately, but in general, the downtown crime um, it is less than what it has been. Zero would be the best, folks. Zero would be the best. But we know you're never going to get zero in crime. There's always those criminals out there, no matter who they are, trying to, to see if a door is unlocked or they jump in your car and grab something. But again, please help the police by giving them as much information as you have and getting those reports in, and it allows us to to do our job as, as both uh, the Inter Niagara Regional Police members and the Police Services Board. So, uh, again, I thank Councillor Danch for bringing that up. Councillor Danch, or sorry, uh, the CAO has something else? Sure, and just one more thing through your worship to Council, um, and I think the Mayor must be reading my notes because I did mean to mention the police are a little bit frustrated to hear that message that the reason I'm not reporting it is because the police won't do anything about it. They said they will do something all day, every day. Um, but to Councillor Danch's point about what is the city going to do, I do have a note that was uh, submitted to me from our communications staff that says we are meeting, um, I'm not sure if it's on June 7th or just after June 7th, our communication staff will meet with uh, NRPS communication staff to try to get the word out on how best to handle these situations and to make sure that it's common knowledge how exactly to go about reporting these crimes. I know that that's after the fact, it's not prevention, but it will help with the response if the community members get that communications piece from city staff. Great, thank you. Councillor Danch? Uh, thanks for that uh, lengthy uh, knowledge there. Um, so for the people that are noticing the tents going up in our city parks and whatnot, should we be calling bylaw to inform them to try to get these guys to move along? I'm sure the police have more to do than uh, tell people to pick up their tent. CAL? So through your worship to Councillor Dan's, probably call the front counter, just uh, the first person who answers the phone at 905-835-2900. Uh, we can get staff out there, whether it's, um, we like to make sure the staff have the right training for intervening with, with people who are homeless. We can use a caseworker, we can use park staff, and we can use bylaw staff. But the best start is just to let us know whether it's a council member or whether it's a member of the public. Because as much as we do have lots of staff out there, there is a lot of parkland, and sometimes these people aren't front and center. So it might be a case that the city just doesn't know yet. So I would call the front counter, the customer service staff, and we'll get the ball rolling. You know, like, I, I'm not trying to be the that person but i think if you make it inconvenient then hopefully they will move along and i'm sorry but you know that's the way it is i mean we don't know what's going on with their personal movements and stuff like that so yeah if uh, we could get by line uh, a little help from nrpd much appreciated thank you great thank you counselor i have counselor bruno next Thank you, Your Worship. After many weeks of a dry spell, I have a few tonight. Um, one, I um, normally I don't, well, I couldn't respond because it was an anonymous uh, phone call to me, but I thought that the call was worthy of note. And so it started off with the uh, citizen thanking me for my service and all of counsel and was concerned that the um, recently there are two um, uh, uh, advertisements on the city website for uh, hires, um, both in uh, corporate services. Um, and, as, and, and so the concern there was that they were, they were new hires. So I'm, I'm going to ask through you if Mr. Bowles could respond to that and its impact on the budget. And the other one um, was that the uh, uh, and the CAO had received a raise. And so um, I couldn't obviously comment back, but I am aware that that is part of his normal review. And, and so that was not of, uh, of concern to me that it, it was in the range of the, um, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, the, uh, the step uh, process in any uh, senior manager's uh, position. 
So I'm wondering um, through you to Mr. Bowles, if you could explain uh, the two hiring positions in corporate services. They obviously were concerned that they were um, management positions, had the salary range, and um, without knowing all the background, wanted me to look into, is this a, a overburden of staff, particularly in the senior manager level? Mr. Bowles? Uh, through through uh, the mayor to council, I think part of it goes back to when we uh, we first did some reorganization in the city and we actually eliminated a, dire a director and a manager uh, position um, in the city at the beginning of the year with uh, with some reorganization with the uh, corporate uh, or the community the community um, service department and sent some of the component back to parks and some of it back into corporate services but like truth be told um, when you look at those two positions we had a departure recently um, in our manager and financial services so we're reposting the manager of financial services um, the second component is there is a supervisor of revenue and taxation we did have a person in another position within corporate services which we moved so we haven't gone up in corporate services additional headcount but we did change the duties of one person to another there is uh, going to be a slight budgetary uh, differential but that budgetary differential will be more than offset by the work that was done on the reorganization of the community service department um, through, uh, so it's net, not net new dollars, and one of those positions was from a departure, so that was a one-for-one one replacement. Is that, is that correct? Mr. Walls? Through the mayor to the councillor, that is correct. So there's no new headcount in the corporate service division, and the dollars are being picked up through the work that was done earlier in the year. Thank you, Mr. Bowles. Um, Mr. Mayor, second. Oh, just before we move on. Uh, sure. CAO. Sure. Through your worship to Councillor Bruno, I would like to address the second component. I, th I sense that you you sort of said that an explanation wasn't necessary, but I think a lot of folks, because I am getting the calls now, and it has been a few months since the annual salary disclosure was published of municipal salaries over one hundred thousand dollars, and uh, and some questions come to me directly about a certain staff member earning a certain amount more than the prior year. And one of the problems with that publication is there's not really the context provided of what makes up that amount. So if a person were to go from 101,000 to 125,000, it looks like they had a 25% raise. But sometimes, many times, it's uh, that $24,000 amount is explained by you know, a vacation that's paid out in cash instead of taken in time off, an amount that's con flown flowed, excuse me, flown, flowed from a prior year. Sometimes it's acting pay for stepping into a role other than the person's normal role where they get a bump in salary temporarily. So in most, and I understand you were asking about my salary exactly, and some of those do apply, but I would caution the user of those published, published um, salary guides to know that a lot of times there's more to the story I'm more than willing to take a phone call at City Hall, extension 306, or our HR department could take a phone call if a person or someone from the media has questions about how one number relates to the number from the prior year, because it's not always a salary increase. Sometimes it's, uh, it's an explained amount. So, but I do uh, understand that you had uh, already resolved that with that particular member of the public. This is just for future reference for other users of those statements. Councillor Bruno? I think, uh, well, actually, I wasn't able to resolve it because I didn't have a, a way to return it, but I, I knew the answer to that question because it was specifically directed at an increase in salary. And I know that uh, annually there is a step program and a performance review, and that's how that happens uh, every year um, for uh, various positions that it uh, that it wasn't um, out of the norm to have a annual uh, step up depending on the contents of your um, uh, um, salary contract. So uh, thank you though for that, uh, that extra information, appreciate that. Um, moving on, I wanted to thank 
um, parks, roads, and I, I know uh, Director Cartwright's um, spoken to um, uh, some staff members in bylaw on the removal of some of these um, commercial signs that have been creeping back up uh, uh, around the city, particularly for wet basements and yarn and other things like that. I, I found, a, so I wanted to send out to the public that they too can respond to um, customer service at portcoburn.ca if they see these illegal signs popping up. Um, I found, um, uh, and I know some other counselors have, have helped in, in removing those, but I, I found a new and inventive way I wanted to pass on to the public because these folks think they can come in and take business away from legitimate businesses here by sticking a sign on public property and defacing the city. Um, what, what they do do by leaving their phone number is a means to get a hold of them. And I would encourage um, people to call and um, speak their mind to any of those um, numbers if they want. I found a unique way now is I've been, um, and if anybody else, I put a post-it note on my bathroom mirror. And if I'm, if I'm not able to sleep that night, I usually return the number on the advertising sign um, if I'm up at three, four or five in the morning. And I, I found that that had some uh, particularly good results on one company. So I encourage members of the community who care about its looks to um, get our uh, staff to pick up those signs if they haven't and to speak uh, forthright about your displeasure with them defacing our community. Um, and finally, some thank yous, um, Mr. Mayor. Um, talking about customer service, uh, Councilor Danch and I had a, a email um, late um, Monday night and I found it this morning in my inbox and it was about some people staying overnight in uh, Jacob Barrett Park and um, some uh, illicit activity and some, uh, I'll say, urinating on uh, playground equipment and neighbors um, responded to that. A concerned resident was concerned about safety for um, what might have been left behind. And um, I had sent out a customer service memo and to um, parks and to uh, public safety. And um, within 11 minutes at uh, 7.30 this morning, I received an answer after sending the email and a parks crew was there with disinfectant rakes and uh, a parks report on the equipment after. And the resident was just elated at how we cared so much about children's safety and community safety and got onto that. So I wanted to thank Brian Wyatt, uh, everybody in customer service uh, for doing that. Uh, got another uh, email on the weekend about a concern on a uh, vacant building. And again, holiday weekend, um, uh, Chief Lawson responds, um, speaks to the neighbor over the phone or at actually attends at the abandoned building. And I mean, those just were two examples of when we get the right information, able to pass it on the level of professionalism and concern and care on behalf of uh, our staff. So uh, kudos uh, to those two incidents. And there's, I'm sure, many more. Uh, and finally, um, because we normally save this to the end when people retire, um, for I, when I saw this, the, the former chief there, now Director Cartwright, I wanted to remind folks that uh, he is retiring as of June 30th. And whilst we'll be able to, as a council to perhaps go around and talk about that towards the end of June, um, those citizens that have had um, uh, interaction with Tom through the years or business community or people that know Tom, it would be nice. Um, for you to know that he is leaving and he has also sold his home moving um, to another community. I mean, it's Sarnia, uh, family members are there. So there's there's not a lot of time he's going to be 
there to be seen in the supermarket or anywhere else. So, uh, Tom, make sure you're attending the next couple meetings in June. And uh, for those out there who want to uh, speak to thank Tom, uh, please uh, don't wait till the last day. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good. Thank you, Councillor. On to items that were pulled. Consideration of items requiring separate discussion, which is item 15. We have item 7.1. Uh, this will be Mr. Bowles giving his uh, departmental presentation. I'm going to have Councillors Bruno and Danch put that on the floor. Mr. Bowles, take it away. Thank you. Through the Mayor to Council, um, I think we're going to put the presentation up here on the screen. And as that's happening, I'm going to fully acknowledge I am not the museum and not Stephanie. And my background's in uh, accounting and some HR matters. So my presentation is a little um, less uh, less glamorous and uh, I'm gonna have to take some courses, I think, from Stephanie going forward on that. Uh, so thank you for letting me present on corporate services. We, we, didn't, we couldn't have everybody join tonight, but uh, Jonathan Wright, our uh, customer support um, manager and Mary Murray is on the um, the call with us as we go through. Maybe we'll be, get a chance to put their faces on there just to make sure the public knows who uh, two of our very important uh, people in corporate services are. So having said that, I guess we'll go to the next slide. We'll jump right in. Um, as we go through the agenda, I highlighted that we we're gonna talk about people achievement, some of the things that are ongoing and some of the metrics. The managers in each of these departments really deserve the credit for putting this together and all the work and then the people that work with them for accomplishing what they have in the last uh, several months to a year. Um, we'll also talk a little bit about some of the global initiatives that all the corporate service departments are going and just to highlight that with our clerk, uh, Amber Lapointe, who is fantastic with her uh, being the acting director of planning and development, she's gonna present on clerks and uh, planning and development uh, separately at one of the future uh, meetings for planning and development. So if we go to the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about some of the global initiatives across corporate services. We're really trying to manage under four simple day-to-day uh, -day concepts is to take care of our customer, our residents, take care of our people, try to make things simple. And uh, we often find trying to get things simple sometimes more complicated, but we wanna get to simple. So it's worth the effort. We wanna make sure there's value in what we're doing. All of our departments, uh, HR has led the way. HR is just finishing off their the tactical plan that will align with the strategic plan should council approve that. And our other departments will follow suit as well as the rest of the city and the CAO can talk more about that work going on later. Um, Multi-year departmental finance and people plans are being put together. I told council that we would start the process to move towards multi-year budgeting. For next year, the 2022 budget, corporate service will certainly lead the way with the template and the example. And then in following years, uh, we'll bring other departments in unless we can uh, get some of the other departments to that point uh, going into the 2022 budget. Uh, a big part of it is I have some metrics today that we can talk about, but our view is to start building the database of metrics, move it to KPIs, and then to uh, target setting over the next year. Uh, also, I think in our philosophy that's important to understand, it's a continuous improvement uh, philosophy. I've talked to a number of counselors on this. Sometimes things are directional as well. You set some goals and you say you're trying to accomplish something by such and such a date. Sometimes we do miss it. Sometimes we're early. Like today, we talked about the water bill and, and, uh, and other items. We've been a council or too late and we do apologize for that. Directionally, we're trying to move a large agenda. And then I think as we go forward, just as the, the little Coles notes, some of the ongoing and upcoming events is really that one year view priority that we're looking forward. A couple might uh, jump into multi-year, but most of it's a one year. And as we build out the tactical plan, that will have our multi-year plan um, going forward. So our next slide, and I'll dive right in, and Jonathan Wright, who is on the call today, I don't know if, sometimes it's interesting how our screens work. You don't, you might not see him in a picture, but uh, he is here um, for customer service. So our customer service team is set up of the four individuals, and we do have a uh, student that is helping us out uh, currently. 
something I think that's been brought up and it may come up later today is I think we really want to emphasize the customer service component. Um, maybe this was just the alphabetical CA versus CU. So we put cashier slash customer service, but something certainly for us to look at going forward is, is we want to make sure that we're emphasizing the customer service and the cashier component is just one of the many things that that group does. I know there were some comments that counselor made that maybe a couple calls didn't get uh, returned and we look forward and we pride ourselves on returning those calls. So if that does happen, we encourage you to touch base with us and let us know about that. Uh, counselor Bodner did that uh, to me, um, follow, had to follow up twice with me and I apologize for that, but we did find a break in our system and uh, some of the information that we were sending to somebody else wasn't getting there. And uh, that actually helped us audit and, and fix that in our, in our system going forward. So if we go to the next uh, slide, I don't have to go through all of the customer service achievements. Many of you know the, the websites and a lot of the forms are now going to digital forms. Um, there's now after hour menu on the, on the phone um, we have queuing systems for messaging and transferring calls we put into place. And I have a couple pictures I'm going to show you of some of the other items. But I would say one of the biggest achievements isn't necessarily the technical items. It's the relationship building. The customer service team is doing a great job, I think, throughout the city. And I'm going to say this equally on parks, on roads, bylaw, planning, and rec. All of them are coming together and are able to share information in a very quick way. And I appreciate, uh, you know, uh, Councillor Bruno's comments that there was a fast response and a good response by multiple departments. And that's because those relationships are being built across the city and it's great to see. Some things that are coming down the pipe that council may be very interested on, uh, credit card payments, we are putting in technology that will let us move to credit card payments coming into the fall also with online donation and receiving systems. Uh, we are looking at taking our citywide uh, and, and seeing how we can move it into a mobile application. Uh, the port pass program is going out and that's a great uh, start for us. We are looking at an internet to be able to share certain pieces of information uh, internally. Um, AODA compliance is becoming a major observation with the website and other documentation that we're preparing. Uh, going forward. And I did note the PDF form uh, changing that going forward. I think anybody with the audit idea would be looking, we're reviewing functions uh, for any duplication that we have. One of the areas is we, we do actually take a lot of payments coming in from cash from different departments and we are looking at ways that we can streamline that. Um, I'll jump into the rest of the customer service slides and then maybe I'll, I'll stop if there's any questions on customer service. So some of the stats going on with customer service, our, our uh, group was able to take care of about 27% of all the calls that came in between January and April. I think that's a huge time saver to the rest of, uh, the, rest of the city because we're able to answer that question and that's because the knowledge base is growing. And I'm gonna show you a slide of why that's growing. Um, you might also be interested to know that our average call time to be able to respond, um, our average conversation is about two minutes and people do get uh, a, a person at the other end of the phone. And normally we can get to uh, most of the calls within about 20 seconds of, uh, of ringing. So we're quite proud of that and the agility of the team uh, doing a great job uh, with that. You might be wondering why is there a, no, maybe no stat of how many calls like get serviced and we, and that's where it's interesting for us. If, if a call is not getting service, we are interested to know about that because we take the view that every call has been serviced. Uh, we do look forward down the road to be able to uh, enhancing our questionnaires that will go out after the calls. We're only starting to highlight that now. Um, and we hope that that will give us additional feedback to how our team has actually serviced and, and supported somebody. So the next couple of slides, I got a couple of graphics here. Uh, this is the, it may not be in the best uh, little little small font, but I think you get the idea when, when it goes on a website, uh, these are two separate websites just side by side, uh, you'll get the idea that uh, we're moving towards being able to take credit card payments, as well as to be able to view your bill online. At the budget time, I said that 
our goal would be to have online bills uh, going into the 2022 year. Uh, the team really wants to do this and is really uh, moving fast on this project. I think it's very possible that we could be having a very positive conversation come the fall on, on being residents be able to access their online bills and pay for them right online this fall uh, with some of that work uh, going on. On the next slide, it shows a little bit about the database and the number of um, options we have to be able to link things to GIS and our assets and, and, and all the number of questions that we may get from somebody as well as the location. And then on our next slide, uh, as we're working with customer service, we've talked many times about our website. I think it goes without saying like Amber LaPointe has, has really been the leader and the driver on the website project. This started well before I arrived at the uh, city. And Alex, our communications officer, uh, class act second to none, being able to help elevate this to uh, the level that I think we're all uh, quite proud of today. On our next slide, and I think this is my last slide on customer service, this is something that's really uh, interesting and I wanted to share it with council. Jonathan put it together um, from his past customer service experience. As people are giving us comments and what to do, and this is how to answer a question for this and that, we've created this database. So anybody that's on the phone can now click a button and get a standard answer. So that we were able to give consistent responses and feedback to people that are calling in. And if I haven't said it before and you haven't seen it before, the three common, uh, the three, last year, the three biggest questions or, or call-ins was tax, water, which was generally how much do I owe and when do I have to pay it, and uh, the beaches. So uh, having those standard answers uh, are, are very beneficial and we'll continue to try to put additional information out on social media to help with that um, going forward. So. A lot of information in a short amount of time. We have a couple more departments to go, but I, maybe I'd open it up through the mayor to council if there were any questions on customer service. Thanks, Brian. Um, oh, there we go. Okay. Councilors, I see your yellow hands. You don't need to wave. We see you. <laughs> I'm going to start with Councilor Wells, then Councilor Bruno, then Councilor Baggett. Councilor Wells. Thank you, Your Worship. Through you to Brian. Um, You've identified that 27% uh, of the calls were answered um, almost on the first call. Do you have any breakdown on the other stats related to that, uh, such as uh, do we have any issues still outstanding or how many are issues are outstanding? Um, those types of questions or those types of stats in regards to our customer service. Mr. Bowles? And through uh, to the mayor to council, we do, and then Jonathan, maybe if he doesn't mind, he's kind of new to uh, to council. He's he's very he's not new to the residents of the city in answering responses. He might jump in and and give a little bit of information. The data bank that he has, and he monitors it throughout the day to see what we haven't followed up on, and as things get longer in duration, does his own additional follow up. So maybe I'll pass it over to our, our manager, customer services, Mr. Wright. Yeah, so when it comes to, um, I guess, citywide and what's outstanding, what's open, basically um, all of our service requests that get inputted by customer service or by a phone call, um, they usually will be closed within, I would say on average, they're closing them within a couple of days because they're adding a work order to them. So a service request that gets inputted in for a citizen um, in regards to say like a pothole on Elm Street, we'll initiate that service request and then it would get closed and a work order would be added into roads, which then could take obviously a little bit longer time to stay open. So depending on their projects and their planning to close that out. Councilor Wells. Just, just for clarification, you've issued the work order or you've issued the service request, you get a work order, but, um, do you get confirmation that that work has been done? Mr. Wright? No, so when it comes to the work being done, I won't get a, like an actual notification. It'll be the management in that division. So if it goes to roads, it would be then in the roads division that would get the confirmation of it being completed. Councillor Wells. 
So in reality, we really don't have any stats on when the jobs are completed uh, through the customer service uh, system. It's just that one's been issued and a work order has been issued and end of story. Mr. Wright or Mr. Bowles? Yeah. So not really. So when we when we issue them, we still have access to monitor the data on it. Um, but we leave it in each division's capable hands to monitor their staff and the completion uh, rate of it. So every manager in each division has their own dashboard for their department that they can monitor and see what's open, what's closed, and how long it's taking to complete that function. And then my role is usually by the end of the month, I do a follow-up of anything that's outstanding outside of that. So if it's something that's lasting longer than it should, that's when a follow-up goes out to see why this is still open. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, okay great. Uh, Councilor Bruno? Thank you, Worship. Uh, Brian, excellent job. I'm not uh, not concerned about the, the prettiness on this one. Uh, you're the bean counter guy and, and the numbers guy. I'm happy for, uh, for the meat on this one. Jonathan, fantastic job since, uh, since you've come over, Amber. Um, I'm pretty high on... Uh, customer service and it was uh, got a chance to do the Disney uh, University course in the previous life and I just know the value of customer service it was myself who called in today and said to Brian on the slideshow I wish it would start off customer service slash cashier because to me I think one of the things when you haven't been in the customer service industry or you don't see the intrinsic fallout that doesn't appear right away, that is a satisfied resident. That is 27% of the people think about this in three months that previously to a live answer, thank you, Mr. Mayor and others, to customer service, thank you, Amerson. Those folks were rummaging around trying to find who to ask that question to. So they hit and missed, they got a voicemail, uh, they got somebody who was away on vacation and didn't call back. And now those 27% of the people that got answered right away effectively are advocates now for us, a satisfied citizen. But most of those questions by those 27% aren't going to get asked again because they got the answer. And they didn't have to play tic-tac-toe to get it. So, I mean, my... What I, I, what I want to answer a, a question to, to, to someone in your group is actually to Mary. Um, so Mary, in terms of, you know, back in the day, the uh, phone operator was the entry level job to the city. And I suspect it started at the lowest pay rate. And so I'm just wondering when somebody joins in the, in the pecking order of, of, of what salaries are, is customer service considered um, a entry level position in terms of pay scale? Sorry, uh, I don't have the collective agreement in front of me. Um, it is on, I would say, the lower end of the salary grid, um, but we are going through a process with QP where we are going to be reevaluating some jobs, and that is one that's on the list. Great, thank you. Um, through you, Mr. Mayor, to Jonathan, that um, customer service CSR workbook that Brian showed in uh, slide 10. So that's packed with, I'm guessing, uh, thousands of bits of information and how many hours of input into that thing. Could you guesstimate that? Jonathan? Yep, yeah, um, that probably took me maybe a week and a half to two weeks. Um, but I had a lot of information and data from um, diving into servers and folders that we had already in the system and then pulling that information and bringing it forward. So we had some of the internal knowledge base already there. Um, but what happened was is that it was very difficult to locate. So for customer service, especially on the phones, um, we need to be efficient, fast and provide clear and correct information all the time. 
So to be able to access that information on a click of a button instead of digging through drives is why I created that format for them. Thank you. Uh, Brian, I'm just wondering, um, in terms of bringing a customer service representative to full sort of training and working capacity. So I think you probably would, would you agree that that institutional knowledge that they pick up through calls after calls and using your CSR workbook is something that takes a considerable amount of time to be um, where you're not searching as much kind of know the answer, or at least you know where to look. So I'm, 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 I guess where I'm going with this is I don't know, it's ongoing training and that, but, but to bring somebody up to a level where you'd want to see them, um, you know, digest that, that workbook, if you will, can you ballpark what it is? Cause you've had previous experience of this. I know it uh, in, in the falls, um, what does it usually take to bring that customer service representative up to kind of the standard you'd expect? Mr. Balls? Two months, one month, six months. So sorry, through the mayor to the counselor. I, I think you said my name and then you- Oh, sorry, I meant Jonathan, I beg your pardon. Something else that made me think you were talking to Jonathan. Okay. <laughs> when you see two young, look, good looking guys, it's hard sometimes on the screen to differentiate. To, Jonathan? Yeah, so um, customer service, sometimes it is overlooked as something that's very easy or simple, but it, it is a process. So uh, repetition is your best friend. Um, when it comes to calls, they're going to get the standard same kind of calls for the first little bit. So it takes about, I would say, three months to get a good grasp of your full job, like 80% of it and then probably six months to a year to basically master what you've learned. Um, but the biggest thing with that workbook um, and just with customer service in general is knowing where to dig or where to find the information. Um, a lot of times, a lot of our CSRs before I came in, they were using our own website to try to find the information. And that was coming up a little bit difficult because they were using the search part of the website to try to find keywords. And that information isn't always the best for internal practice on what knowledge we want to set out for um, our citizens or businesses. So to answer your question, probably three months to get comfortable and then six months per year to master it. Councillor? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And, and obviously alongside of that is someone that's been chosen with, the, I would say, the proper um, personal uh, skills to deal with members of the public and that sort of thing that, uh, you know, you can, you can train and memorize that stuff. But if you don't have the uh, people skills, I guess was a little word I was looking for to do that. And that all comes with the hiring process. So, you know, I guess I, this is leading back to the importance. And I think the, um, the desire to aspire, uh, aspire to this position. I mean, I'm, I'm really concerned that when you have a three to six month learning curve and the institutional knowledge that you create, that it's not something that I'd like to see where we either lose the employee or quite frankly, internally, they for for good reason, want to aspire potentially to a higher salary. And what you do is start over on that curve of learning. And I think if we don't recognize the training in this, and no offense to other positions that are getting hired for, but you know, I, I suspect there are some there that are higher pay in the city that are not three to six months, and I'm mostly thinking inside office um, type type work. But you know, if you know, one of the measurements of value is remuneration, and and the other one is the recognition of where you are in that uh, in that hierarchy of, of city employees, and and so I'm really hoping that the CAO Mary Bryan will look hard at 
um, the cost of replacing someone in customer service and the setback in that efficiency of two minutes. And that, so I'm, I'm really uh, hoping that um, we finally reached the level of recognizing, I mean, the amount of time that this is saving other people uh, in the organization from bounce back calls, return calls, different answers, voice messages. I mean, you know, it's way more than, than the minutes on the screen. It's the, the download minutes that are going, that aren't going to other people. And so uh, just wanted to say kudos to you guys. And uh, I, I think, um, I, I think what's going on is in, in customer service is great. Y'all should be uh, highly commended. Um, I think I may have another uh, question here. Sorry, to, just looking through my notes here of uh, uh, what was uh, uh, going on. Uh, nope, I'm sorry. That is it. Just uh, th thanks very much and uh, keep up the good work. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councilor Baggio. Well, it's a hard follow-up to Councillor Bruno, Mr. Mayor, I'll tell you. Uh, one uh, thing I'd like to bring up on customer service is uh, one thing on our agenda is our draft bylaw, non-parking administration penalty system. And I sort of started researching on the city's website, our present penalty system and the bylaws and that. And the further I dug into it, reading about it, and all of a sudden I got to the property standards committee. And there on the list was one of the members of the property standards committee is Councillor Bill Steele. So when I saw that, I'm thinking like, geez, like how up to date is this thing? Like I'm not even looking at the most up to date uh, issue of the bylaw or what's on the website. So I guess my question is to the, the Madam Clerk, I think she's in charge of uh, updating it, but uh, is there a ongoing update on the, especially the bylaws on our website, that they are horrendous for uh, anybody trying to look something up for uh, up-to-date information, Mr. Mayor. I'll go to the clerk for that. Uh, thank you, through the chair. Um, I'm not sure what it is that you're talking about exactly. If it is the bylaw, then it will most likely be out of date. But if it is the committee's uh, web page, then that should be updated by the department that works on that committee. Uh, and please let us know. Uh, call customer service or the department directly anytime you find a mistake on the web page. We try to comb it as much as possible, but there is some mistakes. Councillor Baggy, was that, were you looking at the original bylaw? I think I was, yeah. So that, yeah, so it, that it, would have, yeah, because that would have the names on it, and if that was formed, obviously when I was a counselor, it would show the counselors that were on it at the time it was passed. But as the clerk said, our committee structure under the committee, the listed committees would have the updated list of members of that committee. But any original so bylaw, like, like if Mayor Maloney had signed a bylaw and that's still on the books, then you may see Mayor Maloney's name on there. Right, so you still... You still be on the books on that bylaw as a counselor then. I, yeah, and I did sit on that committee. Number yeah. of, whatever year it was passed, I remember sitting on that committee at one yeah. time. So Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good. Thank you. Councilor Clavin, did you have a question or was it answered? It was answered. Great, thank you. Okay, Brian. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, the next slide or the next um, department to go through is the financial service group. And I guess the slides will just quickly come back up. So we did the, the same process where we, we identified the, the organizational uh, structure that we have uh, going on uh, right now. Um, we currently are posted, as discussed earlier, for a manager of financial services and a supervisor of revenue and taxation. Um, right now, Jade McDowell is our acting manager of financial services. On the next slide, we can go over a couple of the achievements and projects that are ongoing. Um, I think this year we kind of set a new tone to get the budgets, uh, I guess two out of three, uh, the capital and the levy budgets were done before um, year end, but the uh, water wastewater budget, we were doing 
uh, after uh, year end. We'll have it all in a schedule out to you uh, as council shortly uh, to talk about next year's budget schedule and maybe just a general comment on that um, in identifying that we're going to send a report out with a, with a proposed timing schedule for the 2022 budget shortly. Uh, I'll probably, I will be asking the same structure and happy to take uh, councillors comments on how to do it, but looking for council's input in advance of what they may like to see um, in the budget, either coming through the capital or operating budgets this year or in the coming years. Uh, we do have last year's list that we can continue to work with and look forward to grabbing um, and, and taking new uh, commentary. A couple other things we did, uh, there was a lot of policy development. We looked at borrowing, investing, reserve and capital. Also introduced a new year and surplus report. Um, the audited financial statements, which we'll have to at your next uh, meeting uh, will be done in previous years. They were being done September and October. So we still not quite at the end of the year, but certainly moving in the right direction. We have been introducing a new account structure. We did phase one and you can see under the upcoming comments, we're looking at phase two, which we hope will be live by um, the beginning of July. Um, and then we have introduced project costing for drains and capital which is giving us new reporting. And you're gonna see that when we show you the T1 reporting, um, the new reporting for capital. A lot of capital still needs to be done as a heads up when you see that report, uh, a lot of capital still needs to be done. COVID has had definitely had an impact on, uh, on getting some of those projects uh, through. Uh, some of the upcoming things that are coming down the pipe, user fees are gonna be a big area of focus for us. Um, one of the areas is definitely in the building department and building fees. Our fees are considerably lower than other municipalities, and it is uh, putting pressure on the budget. When we built the budget, we anticipated um, coming back with a higher fee, and I mentioned that during the budget process with some staffing changes that hasn't happened. So it is one of the uh, main projects uh, coming into the back half of the year, definitely. A couple other things, our procurement policy we will be looking at. Uh, and coming back with some commentary. We even hope to do uh, within the next year, start a property tax review, just to look at our property tax system in a little greater detail than accepting the MPAC uh, rule. Uh, in that respect, you can do an audit to make sure that there hasn't been new developments that have been missed or haven't come on. Uh, so th that's something that we're looking at. You'll also see, I guess, triannual reporting. So in June, we'll have a report for the first uh, trimester ending April. And we had a conversation today about monthly water billing. Um, on the next slide, just a couple statistics that are going on in financial services. Uh, we process about 13,800 invoices. Um, now, a lot of those invoices get written out on the same check. Uh, so 1,300 checks, that's why a lot fewer checks get uh, potentially written or ETF payments. Um, if they look at the uh, payments received, we, we take payments from about 86,000 payments will come in. Um, different journal entries because of grants and cost allocations are about a thousand. The total budget of the city this year is just over $40 million. Uh, water bills, we sent out 20,776 water bills. Obviously there's, there's a number of cycles. When we go to monthly, uh, in the future, that number will be closer to 48,000 bills a year. Uh, so tax bills, uh, 18,000 tax bills. And you might be interested to know that outside of property and, uh, and water bills, we only have 282 other kind of sales invoices because pretty much everything else is a direct payment where people come in and they're paying, whether it be for their boating slip or whatever, they're paying right up front for something. Um, for the, for the, departments outside of customer service um, that had the additional kind of pictures to show. I'm pretty much a three, three slide um, presentation. So if there is any questions on financial service, happy to take them. If not, I'll continue on with human resources. Councillors. Councillor Bruno. Thank you. Just one, Brian, um, through you on the water bills. So with them um, doubling in a two and a half times going up in terms of the volume mail paper. Will there be a 
program that we will push hard for online people to receive their bill online and uh, obviously and, and, and pay online just to reduce that call because uh, I actually thought you were going to be taking that number for four months times three for 12 months and that you would be up more like to 60,000 uh, or closer to. But uh, will, will there be a program because because we're going to if we turn that on quite quickly, it would be nice to also turn online billing on as well. Mr. Bowles. Yeah, through uh, through the mayor to council, there definitely is. Um, it was, it's actually, I know I'm talking a lot tonight. Uh, there, one of the slides identified that we're hoping to have that system up and running by the fall, uh, so that way we can uh, incentivize people to log on and and do that, uh, just that, so they can access their bills and and do that online. And the reason it wasn't like twenty thousand times three. Uh, is because a lot of commercial properties are already getting monthly billing. It was just our residential billings that weren't on the monthly. That's why the numbers didn't work out perfectly on a times three basis kind of model. Great. Thank you, Brian. Okay. Thank you. Okay. On to your next portion. Sure. So uh, we gave you an org chart of the human resource department and uh, a goal of ours going forward is to, uh, build out our org chart so that way we can actually post them and people can see them as well as names and maybe one day even pictures. Um, our CAO has given us a lot of number of uh, great ideas and we're taking a look at, uh, at that going forward. So our, our next slide here after the org chart talks about the numerous achievements that have been going on in uh, human resource and Mary Murray is on the on, on the council meeting tonight. She's been with council on a number of other occasions. Um, you can read them on your left there, including negotiations with QP with a four-year agreement, um, a number of uh, activities uh, with related to coalitions, um, and joining out with other municipalities to work on some very important uh, um, topics. One of the one of the ones I want to highlight is just on the training side because it was brought up tonight. Uh, the city has now joined in with a program um, LinkedIn. So we now have a full complement of online learning services that we're uh, rolling out to help people better uh, adapt to some of the online technologies, whether it be Microsoft email or Teams or whether it be as, as straightforward as a customer service and, uh, and dealing with important or difficult conversations. On the ongoing side, performance and development program is something that we're putting together to uh, introduce a new one, to change our current one. It's gonna focus on, and we will, we're will happy to share more information on competen competencies, education, and continuous training. Uh, we are in developing, uh, in the process of developing a new recognition program. Enhancements to the onboarding program uh, is, is something that we're looking at as well as uh, certainly the, the wellness committee. We have had the opportunity to send some individuals for leadership development training this year, uh, despite COVID, most of it being done online, but it's been a great uh, progression for some of our future leaders within the, uh, within the city. Our next slide talks a little bit about some of the human resource statistics that are going on. Um, we have had in the in the last year uh, nine workplace uh, accidents. We have we have tracked those and corrective action and conversations have had to improve our systems. There are two near misses. Um, there were four vehicle incidences we've we've dealt with. Presently, we only have two unfilled positions not posted or filled. We still have some posted, but there's only two that haven't been posted. Um, many of you uh, on council may have noticed that we have been doing a lot of posting recently. We had six retirements this year. Last year, we had a number of retirements with COVID and or people leaving and uh, moving to other municipalities, other organizations. Our HR department has been very busy filling positions. Uh, I just provided the financial statistic here. Uh, thank you to the team for doing that. 16 million of our 40 million budget relates to payroll, about 40%. Um, numbers that we shared with the budget was 180 FTEs, uh, 243 headcount, plus the volunteer firefighters and council members. If you're wondering why I broke those out, it was because if you go back to the report, 
I can reconcile it. Um, that's the only reason we, we broke it out here and we'll include them all too in the, in the future. Um, that's a little bit on human resources, what we're working on. Uh, the, quick, uh, the quick discussion on the slides doesn't, doesn't uh, do justice to the amount of work that's going on in that department right now. I don't know if through mayor, I guess if there's any questions on HR, if not, I can continue on with information technology services. Okay, questions. We have Councillor Wells and Councillor Baggy. Councillor Wells. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, through you to uh, Mary. Um, you've given us some, some statistics in regards to some retirements. Uh, do you have uh, any numbers of, of how many positions uh, we're filling because people have left either through terminations or resignations? Mary? So we do track um, over the course of the year, uh, we track a master sheet of uh, why we're filling each position. So whether it's a backfill due to a retirement or somebody leaving. So we do have that data. I don't have it with me, but I'm happy to go back over the course of last year and this year and break those numbers out for you. Councillor? Thank you. Uh, won't be necessary right now. So uh, I'll follow up with you on that one. Thanks, okay, Mary. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Councillor Wells. Councillor Baggett. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Yes, to Mary, nine workplace accidents. Is that nine workplace injuries or is it an accident? Or are they considered the same? Mary? Um, I would have to confirm with Chardé just to be 100%. Uh, we report. I mean, I guess it depends on how you want to define injury. So I, I can get the clarification for you on that. Councillor? Yeah, it's like how you define accident also. But basically what I'd like to see, actually present a council, like safety and health is a big thing for any corporation, any industry, any city. And I've never seen an injury report or act from the city since being on council. Like, are we losing people with long-term disability? Is somebody have to go to the hospital? Is, is this reflective on on management, like maybe it, it doesn't leave the CAO, go to hire the CAO, but as a counselor and the safety of the workers, you know, inside, outside, I think it's important for a council to get the injury results yearly of, of our whole city. Mr. Mayor. Yep, I'm gonna go to the CAO on this one. Sure, through your worship to Councillor Bagu, I appreciate the question and I'll let, uh, Mary jump in on the answer if she thinks that my answer needs some complimentary information. But it's important to distinguish between long-term disability claims and workplace injuries. So the, the workplace injuries are absolutely employee injuries in the workplace, whereas long-term disability claims could be from, they could be medical issues from home, you know, cardiac or, or cancer or some kind of these issues, or even an accident like a car accident or a dirt bike accident that happens on the employee's own time. So that is a benefit that we provide to our employees and they will cash those in from time to time. Um, the workplace injuries, uh, those are very important to us because that's a reflection of our health and safety record and our, the safety of our workplace. And those break down into two sort of uh, categories. One are lost time injuries. So just like it sounds, that's a that's a situation where a person's away from the workplace due to the injury that took place in the work in the workplace that occurred in the workplace, and that could be a day of a day of lost time, or it could be months of lost time based on severity. Non-lost time injuries are in the workplace as well, and just as concerning, but it means the person was able to continue working for the day. So it sounds like we have some statistics here available to us. And what I might do is bring forward some reports to council so you can see how our safety track record is tracking. It also does have a bearing on the workers, um, the WSIB premiums that we pay as a municipality. So we are a schedule two employer, which means we're self-insured for, um, for uh, the amount of coverage that a person has. So that has a direct bearing on the budget, obviously, how much we have to pay out in losses. So with Mary's permission, we'll, we'll, we, we are already tracking those, but we'll provide that information to council. Mary, anything to add? 
No, uh, we can absolutely provide that information. And, and most of our injuries this year are all very minor, did not result in lock time. Okay, Councillor? I'm really glad to hear about the injuries this year. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Uh, CEO. I would really appreciate the stats for uh, injuries. Uh, so thank you very much. Good. Thank you, Councillor. Just, just one comment I'd like to make. It was in the a discussion I had at one of our retirees, uh, uh, after work when uh, we got together at the works yard in a pretty wide open area and, and uh, one of the staff members came up because uh, his son had, uh, had had COVID and one of the comments he made was that when he was dealing with public health and they asked where he worked he said yeah, I work for the city of Port Colborne and the comment through the public health person he was dealing with they made they said to him that Port Colborne has probably one of the best um, policies uh, during COVID of, of all municipalities across Niagara. So I think that bodes well to how well our staff uh, puts things together and, and how we've uh, supported our staff specifically during COVID. But that's just one snippet of, of how well uh, we're looked at as a municipality and, and how we interact with our employees, whether it be through COVID or in the um, workplace uh, safety, as you uh, stated how important that is and where our senior staff and, and all of our staff uh, have that high on the totem pole as far as uh, uh, importance to everyone here. So kudos to staff on that one. Brian? Great. Uh, thank you. Through through the mayor to, to council, um, I'll keep going with the Information Technology Service Department. Um, it's a smaller department, uh, and everybody I think knows by now that Linda Daniel is um, retiring. She's been uh, instrumental in helping put together a succession plan and uh, work on our program to help hire a new manager of information technology. Um, I am gonna get the individual's last name wrong, having uh, met a couple times, but uh, Wesley Adair um, is from the um, town of uh, Lincoln and will be joining us uh, in the middle of June as the manager of information technology. Lots of experience, worked with a lot of the programs that we've already um, worked with. So we're very excited to welcome uh, him aboard and to be part of the team. Uh, following that hire, the council was, uh, I think, had the foresight to allow us to hire another um, individual into the IT department, which will be, uh, I think very helpful for the department moving forward and we'll take the opportunity uh, to post and hire that uh, and hire that position accordingly. On the next slide, you're going to see um, information technology, some of the achievements, a lot of work around cybersecurity. Uh, Belinda and Jamie, uh, I think the, the city and, and staff, um, we all owe them both uh, a debt of gratitude for the amount of work they did upgrading the system, the Wi-Fi, the VPN, um, our, our whole cloud system to be able to work from home. Uh, the city had next to nothing of that a year and a half ago. And, and to create that over the last year and a half has been a phenomenal um, accomplishment. I think uh, some of the nice, uh, nice things that have just happened recently, our AIMS system, you might be wondering what does AIMS uh, represent? It's really a system that helps with our parking and ticket enforcement. So as um, our bylaw department is rolling out uh, the enforcement, we're now able to track in real time in a much simpler fashion with one another to bill. And uh, our director um, uh, has helped us uh, do just that. Um, ongoing and upcoming uh, items that are coming forward. We want to continue to leverage Microsoft. Uh, we're going to be using the LinkedIn training, uh, definitely uh, looking at the secured backup solutions that we have approval for. I heard there was conversations about um, NRPS and individuals within our uh, within our city. When I look at uh, when I look at what IT can do to help support that, there is a project on the books that we will be giving uh, to the uh, new manager uh, to bring. Um, the genetic security system up to date. And when that happens, the NRPS will be able to link into our cameras. So as we put cameras and we potentially bring the council the ability to bring or add more cameras throughout the city, the NRPS would be able to see those in, uh, in, real, in real time. 
We're also developing a mobile device and implementation uh, program and not to jump around, but we are having a conversation with uh, NRBN and with other providers uh, just to see what, what exists. Um, we have noted that fiber and the internet uh, that can run on it, the speeds have come a long way and opportunities to, to bring high speed internet to the Vail Health and Wellness Center, the library, the museum, uh, the marina and HH Knoll are actually coming together to be projects that this council could consider and staff are looking at putting together a plan for council to consider going forward. It could mean that, uh, that, that residents could access the internet in HH Knoll or if they go see their kids play at the Vail Health and Wellness Center, whether it be hockey or outdoors. Um, and that's something that this council uh, going into the budget uh, program should expect uh, staff to talk more about. Um, building permit software is coming along um, with the new uh, CBO. We look forward to working with them on the building permit software, uh, as well as in general, we're taking a cloud first. So instead of bringing on-prem uh, solutions going forward, we will be looking at the cloud as our uh, first choice really the purpose there is to continue to shrink our footprint and improve our connectivity and security around the whole system. And then there was a couple of statistics that I thought council might be interested. They're a little different for IT than maybe for others, but it was just what percentage of time and uh, projects really, devolve, really revolve, around, revolve around other departments. Um, the finance system takes up about 20% of, of software time that the, the team spend on, um, whereas other administrative aims and all of those combined might take up about 30%. Uh, percent. And then you can see the other systems there. We will be continuing with the new manager of IT to look at that and see how we can continue to streamline. The other statistic is just looking at our cloud penetration. About 23% of our systems right now are in the cloud and our, our move forward will be to continue to move things into the cloud and create a one point system that we can uh, continue to secure. So those are a couple um, uh, points on information technology. If council has any questions on that, our last section will be recreation. Okay, any questions council? I appreciate that. We'll, once we get the new manager in, we'll, we'll get him in front of you so you can ask some questions there too. <laughs> um, last section, recreation, manager of recreation. As we know, there was a, a bit of a reorganization and recreation came back here and parks uh, to uh, the public works uh, division. The two are continuing to meet uh, regularly. Chris, our director of public works has done a phenomenal job um, helping uh, everybody come together under a working group that continues to work, share ideas, share information to continue to build the whole parks and recreation program uh, going forward. Uh, a couple, I guess, items is right now, Blair uh, is our uh, recreational uh, programmer. And I think everybody knows uh, Mark Miner, our uh, Marina uh, supervisor. So on, on the next slide, some of the achievements going forward. And, and we stole the slide or this picture from the work that was done uh, with the strategic planning group when we were looking at the city strategic plan because it was very clear that some of the most important things to our residents was access to water, trails, and the parks. And that's a lot of what's happening in recreation. Um, I think one of the biggest achievements and one of the things that they're quite proud of is in the early parts of the COVID pandemic and when the restrictions allowed or the rules allowed to actually open up with social distancing, they found a way to open up all their programs um, in the early parts within the restrictions and the guidance that was given to continue business as usual. And that happened right until the most recent uh, lockdown. Some of the larger upcoming items that are coming down the pipe, uh, one of them is we're working on an MOU with the YMCA for the uh, for council to consider. And one of the big pushes there is to really not duplicate services and really continue to push um, camps and that through the YMCA, as well as the integration of the front desk. And we talked a lot about that during the budget and how 
that might work and the Vail Center could be an, a great opportunity for people to go when they're coming to the city. Uh, beach development infrastructure is something this group is looking at and this council should expect commentary of that um, going forward into the fall. Uh, connected city, which I talked about under IT, also exists under rec because a lot of those um, components exist under recreation, as well as active transportation, working with public works and others um, under the economic development group, continue to working on active transportation um, going forward. The last slide here is on some of the recreation stats. And I think the rec stats are, I think are important just to pause at, because if you think of the city size, 18, 19,000 people um, on a normal year, and I will say this is one slide that's a little different because they use kind of normal year statistics because the last year with COVID's really looked a lot different. Uh, the normal number of participants that might come to uh, the Vail Center for and, and other areas for tournaments will register about 30,000 participants and, and visitors in tournaments. Um, at Nickel Beach, we'll do about 39 uh, visitors. That could be the same person more than once, but about 39 people would, would go through, 39,000 people would go through uh, the, the beach in any given year, as well as some of the boater statistics we gave. Um, and the YMCA, which is very uh, heavily used by about 2,000 members when you consider our population size. And you will see how fast the participate pass has taken off because we submitted the presentation about eight or nine days ago, eight days ago to, to, to uh, clerks, and we've gone from 2,000 to almost 3,000 over the last week. So that's a little bit about um, recreation, and uh, thank you to that team as well as all the teams in uh, corporate services for the work that they're doing. And if council has any questions on rec or any of the other comments, happy to take them. Any further questions, councilors? Seeing none, great, Brian. Thank you. And, and your staff, fantastic. Good report and uh, um, we're looking for even more of those achievements that you had on the left-hand side of each slide than uh, as we move through uh, everything that you guys are working on. So. Good job. Thank you. Okay, let me just get to this one here. Just bear with me. Yep. No, no I'm just kidding. I just want to read the recommendation. Yeah, I was just... <laughs> Scrolling back. So the Corporate Services Department Report 2021-153 be received. That was moved by Councillors Bruno and Danch. No further questions. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Well, that's carried. Thank you, Councillors. Item 7.2 is the Chief Administrative Office Report 2021-146, subject 2020-2023 Strategic Plan. Be received for information. The council adopt the draft 2020-2023 strategic plan attached as Appendix A. I have uh, movers for this. I have councillors Bruno and Kaleliff and uh, Mr. Long. We'll go to you on this one. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mayor Steele. Uh, good evening again, uh, council. Um, yeah, I don't have uh, a lot to say. Uh, the uh, draft uh, strategic and framework has uh, come to council. I think it came to council back in March. Uh, at that time, uh, staff were directed to seek uh, community input. Uh, we've done that. Uh, so I think council is in a position tonight to, uh, uh, to endorse the plan. Uh, that being said, uh, certainly the CAO, myself and senior staff uh, are available tonight to answer any questions you have. There's obviously a, an opportunity to uh, take any comments, feedback, changes that may that might come out of tonight, and we can incorporate that into the final plan. So uh, the strategic plan itself has been a collaborative effort uh, amongst uh, council uh, and uh, staff, and uh, I know staff are uh, really uh, looking forward to uh, implementing the document Okay, thank you. Uh, I had Councillor Bruno as the only person that uh, wanted to ask a question on this at the time, so I'll start with Councillor Bruno and any other councillors, please raise your, 
for your yellow hand. Thank you, Worship. Just one quick one in the adopting of the official plan tonight. I was wondering about the rollout of a particular part, and that is in our communications, um, uh, our mission statement. Um, is that going to roll out? I don't know if this is a, a Jonathan Alex question, if it's a Gary Long question, if it's a Scott Louie question. Will we be implementing things like the mission statement on business cards, a footer on our emails, a vehicle being redeckled, stationary, that type of thing once it's passed? Uh, Mr. Louis? Sure, through your worship to Councillor Bruno, it is our intention. I, I mean, I, I don't, I'm not prepared to say exactly what the timing will be and what the extent of, of, of the uh, communication will be, but it is our intention to start to get the mission, vision, and values into the workplace and into the community through things like signage on buildings, a tagline that's under the logo on a city vehicle or across the tailgate of a pickup truck, you know, on the back of a business card, even, you know, on the, on the, the footer of a printed press release or so and so on. So you will start to see the mission statement, the vision, and the values that are expressed in the actual strategic plan as part of the consistent communication. Um, and, and sort of, we want it to be top of mind and always present, if you know what I mean. So, so one of those things that you can expect that you'll see uh, both within the workplace and out of the workplace in the community. Great, thank you. Councilor Bruno? That's it, just thank you, Mr. Long and everybody who uh, participated in that. It certainly was a project that you picked up being hired and uh, uh, the CAO was right and you were for the most part. I'm glad there was still the engagement at the end, but you distilled that down from a rather large document that was, um, you know, had various comments, uh, plus minus indifferent uh, to it, to something that I think we all we get behind and that took a lot of skill and time to present it in a format that ended up with not many edits or changes, so thank you. Great, thank you. Seeing no further questions, all those in favor, please raise your hand. And that's carried, thank you, staff. That was great, Mr. Long, your department, Mr. CAO, your department. Item 7.3. That Community Safety and Enforcement Department Report 2021-150 be received for information. I have Councillors Bagu and Councillor Bodner to move that. Councillor Bagu, question on this? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just have one uh, comment and question on, what is it, uh, 7.0. I know Sherry's not online, so maybe I'm just talking to the sky, but uh, service of documents or notice. Basically, it's about when there is a... Uh, Pelly notice to be issued to the resident. I remember back before I was a counselor, there was an issue where somebody had a property standards violation and the city just put something in their mailbox. But meanwhile, the people moved away to another city and uh, city hall taxation department did have their proper new address, but Bana did have to go into the work of finding a new address because it said in the bylaw all you gotta do is drop something off in the mailbox and that's good enough so this person got fined and uh so basically what i'm asking here is uh that uh, our city go through all talk to each department and uh because there's people that have addresses for the taxation department that they forwarded but bylaw all you gotta do is phone over to there and get the right address. So it doesn't put the person in a pickle. It could be a tree coming down on somebody's property. Then all of a sudden the city's spending $2,500 in billing the uh, taxpayer where the taxpayer could have did something on their own rather than uh, just get that, Mr. Mayor. So what I will do is I could uh, email it by concern to uh, Sherry Hansen and uh, she well, we, can get back to me, Mr. Mayor. That's well, okay with uh No, we you. actually have Mr. Cartwright on where that question goes to. It doesn't go to Ms. Hansen. It goes to Mr. Cartwright. 
So okay, he's, he's, he's the big here guy. tonight. So, Mr. Cartwright, can you answer the councilor's question? Yes, uh, Your Worship. So, uh, to council and to uh, all of council, actually, uh, this this document you have before you tonight is the first step of a three-step process that's going to be before council both tonight and in the upcoming council meeting of the 14th of June. Uh, we've identified issues such as what you've just spoken about. And what you're going to see uh, between this document, this document basically is for council to review tonight, will be open to further discussions on the 14th of June to go along with uh, another report that's coming to council, which will deal with the core services of the bylaw department. But more importantly is the, uh, the uh, enforcement policy that's going to be coming to council. That's been worked out between staff and our city solicitor and that will, in fact, deal with the situation that you just dealt with or spoke of, uh, Councillor Bagno, with regards to ensuring that people get the information that's necessary. So it's a combination of various things we're trying to put together in a package. Uh, when I took on this new role, that was one of the, the things that I had to deal with was try to get things reorganized to better facilitate the more effective and efficient manner in which we deal with things across the board. And this is the outcome of that that work that's taken place between when I started and now. So hopefully, hopefully after the 14th meeting, council will have a more clear understanding as to exactly what all those steps are gonna look like and how much more effective they're gonna be. Great, thank you, councilor. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mr. Carwright, I sure hope we get this stuff done by the end of June because uh, we might have to keep you over here for an extra week or so <laughs> to complete it all. But uh, I do appreciate all the hard work you're doing and. Uh, I think a lot of our counselors and residents appreciate we're updating these bylaws. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good. Thank you, Councillor. Any further questions? Councillor Clayla. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Mr. Cartwright. Um, can I just ask you, so is this, be, are we going into a more proactive or are we, is this still reactive kind of policing? Is it, is it, does somebody have to report these in order for it to just kick the process in or will this be bylaw out there looking for these offenses? Uh, Mr. Cartwright. Through, you, through your worship, thank you, and to council. Um, so quite frankly, in my previous role with the city as fire chief, that was always a bit of a, I'll use the term sore point with me, that it seemed that things weren't proactive enough. So in my opening discussions with the CAO, uh, he and I both agreed that we wanted to take a different approach to how we do things in the, within the city, where at all possible. There's going to be times when obviously we can't do it for various reasons, but our role and goal is quite frank, frankly to be more proactive, to deal with things more quickly, more effectively, and more efficiently. Uh, that will take some time because it's a whole new way of doing business. But with these, with what you have in front of you tonight and what's coming before you on the 14th of June, that will greatly appreciate or assist us in getting to that new goal. Uh, I, I'll just give you a quick idea of what, we're, what we've done here. We've gone through all of our bylaws that uh, come into play when it comes to uh, uh, enforcement. Um, we actually, you will be seeing before you with the assistance of the clerk's office and bylaw staff, you're, we're redo, reviewing bylaws from as far back as 1990 that haven't been uh, uh, revisited, relooked at with regards to fines and, and how we do things. So all of that's going to be coming before council at another meeting after the 14th, in which I think there's 11 or 12 bylaws that are going to be updated with under the new fine structure once council approves it. Uh, to go along with that, it gives us more tools. Before, the only tool we had was to uh, provincial offenses, take them to provincial court. We're getting away from that and going to the AMPS program, which then allows the city to collect all of the money instead of a minor percentage of it. And quite frankly, because of the system that was previously in place, it's, it's very di difficult to deal with, a maneuver, uh, very time consuming. And at the end of the day, when we got a, a, a fine before court, if we did go to court, and I'll, I'll share with you tonight that this city has not been to court in 20 years for uh, a bylaw infraction. Uh, that in itself uh, it doesn't bode well in my mind from being in my previous role. We felt that it was a very effective way to do with it, deal with it. And I think that you, you'll find that by being able to write tickets, it gets people's attention immediately to react to it. Uh, that would only be done if in fact people weren't cooperating with us as we do in the fire department. If they cooperate, we work with them. If not, we take them to court and or we do the job and then we bill them for it. The same thing will hold true within the bylaw department. Councillor? Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Carr. I, I'm, I'm believing proactive because, um, you know, I hear the complaints all the time from people and nobody wants to phone in and make that complaint. And yet they are complaining about the bylaws not being upheld. So I, I really want to thank you for all the work that you're doing on this. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Councillor. No further questions. All those in favor to receive. Thank you, Council. And we know that's coming back. Item 7.4. The Planning and Development Department Report 2021-152 be received and that the Zoning Bylaw Amendment attached as Appendix A to Planning and Development Report 2021-152 be approved. I have Councillor Baggio and Councillor Wells moving that and I'll go to Councillor Baggio. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, one question I have maybe for, uh, Mr. I guess Mr. Schultz is out here. Or, oh, there he is popped up uh the one discussion we talked about was the neighbor with the berm in the uh just the barricading off with some of the things and can you let let me know what became of that after it came to the uh council mr schultz through you mr mayor to councillor bag you um that was a discussion that was had at the public meeting um as council would recall um, the berming and landscaping will um, be addressed through a future site plan control application uh, should council choose to approve this bylaw. Um, through that application, uh, proper screening, uh, being fencing, berming, and landscaping would be uh, looked at, and also ensuring lighting isn't uh, being shown on neighboring properties. Um, so that was where it was left off, and I believe council uh, brought that up at the public meeting as well. That um, some of those concerns could be uh, potentially mitigated through that process. Councillor? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. That's all. Great. Thank you. Any further questions? Seeing none, all in favor, please raise your hand. Opposed? That's carried. Thank you, Council. Sorry, item 16 has been dealt with. Are there any notices of motion tonight? Thank you, Council. There are no minutes of boards or committees. We are going on to bylaws. We have four bylaws this evening. Bylaw 19.1, 19.2, 19.3, .1, 19.3, and 19.4. Before I call on the uh, uh, to move, the, uh, move and pass those bylaws, we are pulling one bylaw, which is item 19.3. Bylaw to amend zoning bylaw 6575 slash 30 slash 18 respecting 72 Cloudy Street East and vacant lands to the north and the east. I'll have uh, Councillor Wells and Councillor Clayliff move that. Uh, Councillor Wells. Thank you, Worship. Um, question um, for clarification in regards to um, the building height on this one here. Um, I know that we've we've got the bylaw in front of us. The building height came in after the public meeting, in the, and I know there is some concern in regards to um, the actual height uh, variance on that. So, I was asked uh, through you to uh, Mr. Scholes, um, is the process being followed for the public hearing on this? Do we have to go back for a public hearing uh, to address the height, Mr. Scholes? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Wells. Um, the matter under the Planning Act um, is brought forward through a public meeting through that, um, that application. Um, because the use is being changed, um, staff has the ability and council has the ability to tailor the use um, in the bylaw, how they see fit to facilitate the development. Um, so the short answer to your question is, is no. Um, Issues like like height and uh, setbacks can be uh, tailored by council through through an amendment process without uh, returning for a public meeting. Councillor Wells, thank you. Okay, Councillor Clayoff. Through you, Mr. Mayor, I I think basically that's the answer to my question because because we had changed it from the. Um, 15 to the 11 i just wondered if it had to come back as well and that we had followed everything 
in order to maintain the transparency, I know that I'm sure all the councillors received an email today from Melissa Bigford with concerns, and I just wanted to be sure that we were being transparent and that we had followed all the processes properly. So, David, you're assuring me that we have on all of this? Mr. Schultz? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Clayliffe, uh, yes. Councillor Clayliffe. Okay, any further questions? Okay, seeing none, we will pass these in block. So we have Councillors Wells and Councillors Clayliffe uh, moving the bylaws to be moved in block. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Oh, oh. Councillor Danch? No, no, do you have a question, Councillor Danch? Oh, okay. So I'm just going to go back to Councillor Walls. Do you want to deal with this bylaw on its own? Yes, uh, you Mayor, uh, I, would, I would prefer that. Okay, great. Sorry, Councillor Wells, I'll, I'll do that. So we're going to go to item 19.3, Council. So for item 19.3, all those in favor, please raise your hand. All those opposed, please raise your hand. Councillor Danch, what is your vote? In favor or opposed? Sorry, I was uh, I was talking to my wife and uh, didn't, didn't quite catch it there. So Can I you just run that, run that by me quick, please? Yeah, it's item 19.3, the bylaw to amend zoning bylaw uh, with the number uh, for 72 Clowley Street East and vacant lands to the north and east. It's the partially land that we own and, and the other is the Fontaine property. I'm in favor. Great, thank you. That's carried thank then, you. Council. Thank you. So on the balance of the uh, bylaws, I'll go back to Councillor Wells and Kalalov to move the balance, which is 19, 1, 2, and 4. All those in favor? All those opposed? That's carried. There are no confidential items this evening, Council, nor procedural motions, nor information items. I now will adjourn this meeting. Great job, everyone. Thank you very much.